not believe your eyes If ten million fireflies Lit up the world as I fell asleep Cause they fill the open air And leave teardrops everywhere You'd think me rude but I would just stand and stare I'd like to make myself believe That planet Earth turns slow it's hard to say that I'd rather stay awake when I'm asleep Cause everything is never as it seems Cause I get a thousand hugs from ten thousand lightning bugs Is they tried to teach me how to dance A fox trot above my head, a sock hop beneath my bed A disco ball is just hanging by a thread Pushing through the market square So many mothers sighing News had just come over We had five years left to cry News guy wept and told us He said Earth was really dying Cried so much his face was wet Then I knew he was not lying I heard telephones, opera house, favorite melodies There were boys, toys, electric guns and TVs My brain hurt like a warehouse and had no room to spare Had to cram so many things to store everything in there And all the fat, skinny people And all the tall, short people And all the nobody people And all the somebody people Never thought I'd need so many people Girl my age went off her head Hit some tiny children and If the black hat that pulled her off Then I think she would have killed them Soldier with a broken arm Used to stare into the wheels of a Cadillac 
chop now to kiss the feet of a priest And queer threw up at the sight of that Well, think I saw you in an ice cream parlor Drinking milkshakes cold and long Smiling and waving and looking so fine Don't think you knew you were in this song And it was cold and it rained So I felt like an actor And I thought, ma And I wanted to get back there Your face, your ways The way that you talk I miss you, you're beautiful We got five years stuck on my eyes Five years, what a surprise We got five years My brain hurts a lot Five years, that's all we got We got Five years. Brian Moser. Good morning. Good morning, Charming. Good morning, Tony. How you doing? I'm good. Are we in the control room today or the theater? The uh, theater. Let's see the theater. Yeah, the colors yeah. are better. <laughs> between your and mine avatar is it's it's a beautiful combination there do you mind if i um start with a public service announcement um, yes, I, I really like the the um the, the the finale with cal at the end of your first video cal oh, relieving cal. Uh, herself yeah. yes every time well, i watch I, it i see new things mm -hmm. Oh, well, this past week I've uh, come to learn uh, something new about okay. cows, and uh, I'm going to cut to the chase. Ladies and gentlemen, do not litter. Do not, oh. throw, your trash, do not throw your trash out the window. Um, I don't care what you do in your cities. <laughs> I expect the cities to be uh, right. dirty and disgusting. slimy, although I find that quite disgusting too, but... Uh, do not litter when you're out in the country. When you're out driving uh, from town to town and you s suspect that nobody's looking, don't throw your litter out the window and do not throw your cans or bottles or whatever this is what the out the window. They blow into the fields. Oh, it's worse. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then um, the farmers go over their fields with their tractors and Top it all up. these t tin cans yes! and they get rolled up into the bales of hay Brilliant. Throughout, the, throughout the entire world. Many cows suffer horrible deaths. And wow. if you throw out a can, well, I, I hate, well, I'd hate to think that we'd reincarnate back into a cow who ends up cheering up <laughs> One of these shards of metal. That sounds and, like a video game. <laughs> well, the thing is that it's real and it's horrible and it's disgusting. So, That's very good. And I, you know, it's funny because I'd heard back in the 90s, one of the things throwing your cigarette butts out that, you know, it was popular to smoke. You flick your butt, yeah. that was half the fun, flicking your butt with your middle finger there. And I remember reading, because I was a greenie kid, and I remember reading uh, an article that said, you know, don't throw out your cigarette butts because the animals eat them and then their babies are born with, you know, birth defects or something. I'm sure it said something really horrible. And that was it for me. That, that tiny little thing was enough. I'd never thought, yeah, the animals might eat it. I can't. So I would never, even though I smoke, I've never thrown my butts out or, you know. I mean, that's not true. Can't, I mean, it's not that I haven't. I don't. It's I try very hard not to. And whenever I have, it's you typically been an accident. I would have them piled up in my car, you know. Yep. If there's enough space to carry the trash, there's enough space to carry it back. Yes. <laughs> I closed loop, fuckers. <laughs> yeah. I used to be a long, long time ago, but, but uh, I never a lot of thought about it in those terms. Neither did I. Seeing it myself, you know, if that's not a metaphor for cannibalism and turning plastic, a a fake 
altered state. We're no longer clay. We're now plastic. Our bodies have to adapt to all of this and those that can't keep up. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you put it in terms of a fake altered state because <laughs> it's connected uh, to this concept of this God helmet and all that other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Here's the deal is that the farmers, when they roll up their bales of hay, they run the, the hay through filters to try their best to clear out the trash. And their filters use magnets to collect the metal. The aluminum tin cans are not picked right. up by the metal. And the right. plastic bottles and glass bottles, they're not picked up by the magnets. Mm. And so we thrive in the modern industrial era upon the magic of magnetism. Without magnets, we wouldn't have motors and wheels right. and engines and, right. uh, and electricity and all that stuff. And it cannot solve the problem of cows re chewing their cud and tearing through their entire innards from bow to stern with their trash. Mm. You know? Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, wow, please smaller. don't throw your trash out the window. That's very horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're out on a walk and you see trash, why not just pick it up and carry it home? Maybe you can set an example for somebody else. Maybe make a what? difference. I had to tell you my wee one just because you, I'd get up and go get it, but it'd take me too long and it's not worth it. Let me just tell you what it said. She had to write a postcard to someone and she chose <clears throat> the mayor and it was for the litter problem. She is greatly bothered by the litter she sees. Now, this is not something that I've taught her or that I've read recently. She thought about it what the world's problem was. And she looked around and immediately saw litter. We live out in the country, right? There's a litter problem in our town. And my wee one has wrote a postcard. I'm, I'm very tempted to send it, but I don't want the attention, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it would probably be cute or something like that. So it's very sweet, but. You know, I um, encourage folks to, set an example go out on a walk with a garbage bag and pick up whatever you see and maybe somebody driving by will see you doesn't belong there you know at the very least somebody who doesn't belong in your town who's driving from town to town they're commuting and they're tempted to throw something out well they'll see you and they'll, they'll hold on to it and save it for the next town next that is town. covered in litter. And right. Maybe, They'll yeah. feel bad. They'll feel yeah. bad about throwing it out. They just saw you trying to pick it up. You'd be a dick. You'd be like, hey, man, what are you doing? They yeah. don't want to be a dick for it. It's some of them. Some of them will choose to be a dick. But let's hope. That's very brilliant what you just that's said. The best, that's the best thing you can do. And, um, well, you know, without forcing and coercing your neighbors or whatever. But at least your neighbors will see that you give a damn and maybe they won't litter and maybe they'll Fair join enough. you on the next walk. It trickles, doesn't it? It's, it's pay it forward. Hopefully. I think they made a whole movie about it. A Star yes. Trek Starbucks had a campaign about it for fuck's sakes. Yes. I love the truth in movies. Oh, Beautiful. there's so many dots to connect, mm -hmm. <laughs> but ultimately try your best ladies and gentlemen to set an example, I, uh, I got into this habit uh, oh, several years ago uh, when I first started living out in the country out of the city, seeing a bunch of old men in the morning walking down the highway with a garbage bag. And it was just a thing in that uh, part of the country. Uh, old well, men would just walk down the highway and collect trash. I had this idea a lot back in my 20s because we would had family out in the country and I had this idea for a, a photography book 
where I would go and take a picture, like very photo-esque of the littered, as if the litter itself is the art and yep. clean it up and then take another photo. And it just be these, when you opened the pages, it would be this side by side of. of oh, that's awesome. Dirty oh. or to clean, but I just could, nobody would do it with me and I can't do it by myself. So <laughs> now I never made the book, but there you go. I'm a brainstormer more than an active doer. Yeah. But that would but be I a great idea that. for I a video. That would be a great book because if you could see the artistic side, there was something so beautiful about the trash to me at that moment. You know, I was like, that's so ugly and yet so profound. <laughs> you know, um, not a fan of the trash. You want to clean it up. But just in its nastiness, it was a picture of what the world was. You know, from an artistic point of view, I would stand in the art gallery and go, fuck, that's gorgeous. <laughs> Even yeah. though... It's disturbing me, you know, and that was just a random road, not made for a photo. You know, this is just a random road out in the middle of fucking nowhere. Even why does it look like this? This is what these people do with their own towns, you know? Yep. Yep. I, uh, okay. Punks you, is my, next topic. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I want to, uh, expand a little bit on what I learned about, about this God helmet uh, okay. gimmick. Um, and I'm going to start off with what I believe is a little bit of a magic trick. Um, the, oh, the technology depends on magnets. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this character, uh, Michael Persinger, um, who's, who created this and promoted it and did all the research. I suspect he's got some semblance of an agenda mixed in with his Most real science. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I, I did wonder, look and he is linked with things like the EU and he's gone and oh, talked. Yes. He's definitely one of their friends. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to first start off with exposing a bit of the tricks or at least ways what I believe is a red flag to identify right. that there's a trick. Okay. And even before that, I want to start off with the, a worldwide trick, and that is magnetism. When a scientist of this sort starts lecturing or whatever, and if you can see that he's talking about a technology that depends on magnets mm -hmm. or electricity, start with the first question that nobody can answer, and that is, what is magnetism? Mm. And he, he can't answer it. Nobody can answer it. Nobody really knows. Nobody really knows what electricity is. So I'm of the opinion that he, whoever's presenting this agenda or this science or this lecture for free, all this wonderful stuff free on the interwebs, but cannot acknowledge our basic assumptions. Right. Um, it will expose his agenda or because his prejudices is, or what he doesn't want to talk about in sharing this newfound knowledge or whatever. He d and, it is the electromagnetic wave. So yes. that makes me think it's a little of both anyway. Yes. Okay. And um, I want to also roll back the tape. This is inspired by you. Do you, I, I don't know if you remember a long time ago, you said something along the lines of, know your agreements. Do you remember that? Mm. I, I read the it's agreements cool. too. I remember yeah. reading the, I've got it sitting right here still. Huh? Yes. And the principle of an agreement is similar to an assumption. Uh, like if, if somebody's lecturing you or we're talking, we assume certain things as dumb as it may sound, we assume we're talking the same language and we're using the same definitions of the same words. That's, kind of obvious, but it's yeah. not when it comes to the media and them putting forth agendas. But when it comes to this science, um, the assumption is how magnetism works. We don't know how it works, but we can describe how it works. And from there, 
it'll give you a bit of a stepping stone in the right direction to understand other assumptions of this scientist. And uh, one other thing that this Persinger guy put forth, and it, it kind of gets people riled up, is the numbers. Numbers are used to baffle people and one of them was his seven hertz of the brain or something like this. Mm. How whatever circulation of electromagnetism in our brain, it circulates at seven hertz. And this other thing in the earth circulates at seven hertz and something else at seven hertz and on and on and on. Like as if seven is a magical number, which it is. Right. I pointed okay. that it, out. I said, it, it, that's I right. don't know if, yeah. I said, isn't it is that a magical thing? Number. We got seven, sevens everywhere. Yeah. That's right. It, seven is a special number in that we've got seven colors in the rainbow and seven notes in the musical scale and seven days of the week or, you know, they're repeated four times or whatever for the lunar cycle, so on and so forth. So there is something special about the number seven in our physical world. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to him, saying seven hertz, mm -hmm. I encourage folks to ask, okay, what are the assumptions? And the assumption is a hertz. What is a hertz? Unless he or me right. or you, unless we can describe what is a hertz, there's nothing really magical about the number seven. In fact, it becomes a magic trick. You see, because a hertz is a man-made measurement. It's mm -hmm. like seven inches we can say oh this is seven inches long or this is seven feet long or this is seven miles long whatever these are all man-made measurements or units of measurement and so is a hertz now the colors in the rainbow are not man-made concepts the notes of the scale of the musical scale are not man-made concepts they're natural concepts but the hertz is a man-made unit and so when he starts telling us, oh, seven hertz of this, seven hertz of that, seven hertz of that, he's playing a magic trick. And he's using our association of the number seven to real natural phenomena. Well, that and, is what he studies, you see. Yeah. You know, he, he's in the realm, not of the science realm, but of this paranormal. He, he's balancing between the two. He's standing on the fulcrum at the top between the two, the physical science world of frequencies and the paranormal world. Exactly. Gods. <laughs> and he's trying to pull them together. He's trying to say they're connected. That's right. And now, why would he want to do that? Because they're bound and fucking determined to teach me there's a devil. That's why. They're bound and yes. to split my mind into two entities when I'm actually one. What I, I, what I believe is that the way it's going to happen is through okay. technology and mass surveillance. And they're not going to tell us that there's a Wizard of Oz, a real man, operating this, these machines and checking out the data or whatever. They're going to tell us that all these things are supernatural and they're going to tinker with stuff and lead us to believe coincidences are supernatural when it's actually the referee redirecting the puck uh, or mm -hmm. stacking the deck. I did find a couple things interesting. He did say, and I did find that repeatedly, that um, it doesn't give you this. So someone who's had it a near, say a near death like, or, you know, what we would categorize as a, as a true experience of, of this, um, or experience fainting regular, you know, you have to have had the experience first to know what it feels like. And yeah. in all the reports, those that had had them in the previous claimed that it gave them a sensation, but nothing like what they experienced. I have a feeling if I wouldn't put it on, it'd feel like I was asleep. You know, I would go, none of this is even close, but fair enough to you, you know, or maybe I would get the exact experience. But I know not many of the people that had that went to test 
claimed that it felt exactly the same. It was like a watered down version of what they experienced. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, that means he's not really on it as much, but I think it's connected. I do think that they're touching upon the areas that create these things, but they can't recreate these things. You need to have two, you need to have a left and a right in order to recreate it. So the fact that you can give me an, a drug that gives me an experience of what it's like to say die or to be in a cartoon or something like that, you can't actually do that for the person until there's another side, right? Yes. And I believe some people are more susceptible or able to get into that state of mind more so than others and my suspicion is that this like this sort of research is trying to lure people in to become test subjects mm -hmm. they're looking for people who can tap into this fifth oh, or sixth dimension or something like right this. now it would be Pardon? like a return of the 60s and, or the 70s where you have just all these, remember all the films that were coming out, the ESP, and they were doing all the experiments back then with people who claim to have that whole, the seventies is back. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of a film, I, I, I want to mention a film that is, that plays upon this concept. It's a film called Strange Days that came out in 1995. Um, the, before talking about the, the theme and the, and the science or supernatural or whatever, I want to encourage folks to watch the movie for the music. The musical oh. soundtrack of that mo movie is phenomenal. It's okay. one of the best from, okay. from that era, in my opinion. But the premise of the movie is that there's a technology developed that's kind of like a God helmet, but it's tiny and it can fit under a hat and it can fit under a wig. It's well, kind I of like, here, but I can put it in myself. <laughs> I don't even need yes. to put the, to put the mono, the, the yes. whatever the tracking device in my stomach. I put it on myself in the morning when I get ready. Yes. And what it does is it records what your brain experiences. Oh, so fuck that, me. I just yeah. had a thought. <laughs> I keep going. Jesus it's, Christ. Yeah, it's okay. creepy. But ultimately, the whole theme of the movie is to play upon the concept of voyeurism. So what people do is they record their experiences and other people can put the cap on and just sit and recreate the experience much like you can record a video and sell the video to somebody who just wants to watch the video. But this brain helmet cap thingy um, records everything, not just the visual, but the auditory and the sensory experience. So ultimately it becomes uh, a, a medium for which people sell snuff films very disturbing but um it, it's it, it's an interesting film yeah, and, it um, good. yeah it uh it was directed by Catherine bigelow who did a lot of famous movies um and it was written by james cameron the guy who did the terminator and the titanic and everything in between with i think avatar and whatnot and right um yeah it was it, it's got a lot of important characters in the uh, production of the movie, but uh, it, the, the movie Robin itself. In it? Pardon me. It's a duck wants to know. Does it have Robin Williams in it? No. 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 I'll um. Uh, ah, sorry. I'll, Next question, duck. <laughs> yeah. No. It's called. Uh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll write it into the uh, the chat. It's. Okay. Uh, is it D-A-Z-E, Strange Days? No. Um, no, it's not even, okay. <laughs> Let me change my notes then. <laughs> um, yes, write it in. That would be great. There we go. 
Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, strange days. Okay, let me change that. Z. I just assumed, you know, that was silly of me. Dude, there is another five. movie. I think. Yeah. Okay, I've seen dazed and confused. I've been dazed and confused. Um. Yeah, that's uh, good. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you heard folks just for the music. The music itself is hypnotic. It's really, it's a very good soundtrack. But the premise behind it, it was to pre-program our generation into this concept of technological voyeurism. <laughs> and, Great. Uh, it's, uh, but, but it plays upon the same sort of concept of a cap and electrodes and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and uh, this this uh, god helmet thing is also similar to something that came out a few hundred years ago. People wore lightning rods on their head when they were out in in open areas. Um, apparently, farmers would wear them to protect them in stormy weather when they actually had to work outside. They couldn't go inside and they're vulnerable to being struck by lightning. And so they'd wear that. Maybe there was uh, a lot of static. What was going on in the world? Yeah. Everybody so prone to static. Maybe they weren't necessarily being, you know, lightning, but static, like a shock at the pump or something. You know what I believe is yeah. that what we on occasion experience on earth as a, as a um, uh, being struck by lightning is exactly that. It's an accumulation of static that just builds up and there's just too much of it. Yeah. So uh, much like, you know, when rubbing your feet along a carpet builds up static. Or I was thinking about static earlier when you were talking about the plastic, because it becomes a stat plastic is that's why you rub a balloon on your head. Right. So there's, yep. there's a staticness to, if you've ever seen micro particles of plastic are static. That's why they make staticky little dusters and things like that, that attract through having a, a charged item. Yes. And, um, it, uh, static manifests yep. self, pretty much everywhere, um, just more so with certain materials than others. Static but, is um, what I see. If you ask me what what it, what everything is, I just have static. That's how it presented itself to me way back when. And I asked that question. That was the visual I got. So basically static. Negatives and positives bumping into each other. <laughs> yep. Repeatedly, yeah. sometimes you're a negative for a while, sometimes you're a positive for a while, but you're always one or the other. <laughs> well, then that leads me into where do we come up with the concepts of reincarnation and back and forthisms? These, you know, it starts to go down a, a trail. You know, I'm willing to wait to find out. <laughs> I want to know. I'm fine with it. I, yeah, I'm going to, I know you know, you want to sit back and watch for a minute. I That's hope that there's plan. an option. I hope we have an option. Like I, God, like, we can sit up and watch for a minute, knowing we can exactly. interfere. And then one yeah. day we go, God damn it, I want to interfere. I think I can change things. <laughs> but then you get down there and things get in the way and environments alter and change and you miss the jump and the wave took you out a little bit too far and you drown. The next one, you go back up, you'll watch for a while and you'll go, hmm, I think I've got the pattern. I'm going in again like a double Dutch. And this time you land it and you start Dutching with and you become a Duchess. I don't know. <laughs> Save some babies from war, starvation. And then you go back up and you go, well, I didn't really make much of a difference at all, did I? The thing I is better sit back and watch some more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I hope there's an option. <laughs> I, I, I hope there's an option. <clears throat> I want to um, expand a little bit more about this God helmet thing and the premise behind it. Okay, keep going. Where 
part of his research was to show that these um, mental events of telepathic uh, abilities of some sort happen during electrical storms or thunderstorms or essentially um, meteorological events that are quite disruptive. And um, like you said, you during, you know, like when was that 20 years ago, you had this premonition of an arson. An arson? And oh, right, right, right. I think for a minute, what are you talking I was on a different page. I'm back in the same chapter as you, yes. <laughs> well, one thing with his research and um, the associated research in, along the same lines is that what they do is they try to induce or provoke these feelings in the brain with their, their magic hats. And most of the subjects say that they experience anxiety and a feeling of fear. And that's the commonality um, amongst this, the, the test subjects. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to figure that out. Now, I want to throw out a theory. Okay. And ultimately, the, because you, you asked if the prophets and the oracles of long ago were tapping into that same faculty. Yes. And that's my suspicion. Yes. And um, I want to suggest a purely physical explanation uh, or rather a non-magical explanation of what you experienced and what they're 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 observing in the research and that is perhaps this electrical field disruption is sensed inside our brain perhaps the pineal gland um, is triggered and could, whether it's through the magnetism or x-rays who knows but ultimately there's a, a physical organ in our brain that senses a change of something uh -huh. and it provokes a, a feeling of anxiety or fear uh -huh. or some swing in emotion. Uh -huh. Now, um, this is just a suggestion, okay? But perhaps leading up to this electrostatic uh, thunderstorm the people who control the emergency vehicles in the city have this strategy where they get prepared for a possible lightning strike or they get prepared for people going crazy and yeah. what they do is either they get ready for it or they try to feed it and provoke it by driving around town with their sirens and their lights. And so leading up to this event, we and everybody in the area hears more and more sirens. And so subconsciously, we have the idea of impending danger or there already is yeah. a danger. And so the idea of a fire is coming could have been inserted into your anxiety. In other so, words, I just happened to roll the right dice when I guessed, right? Yes. Right. And That's they fair. provoked it. They, they, they stacked the deck. It's possible. Now, yeah. Now, um, for what it's worth, it's a man-made danger. Like an arson is a man-made danger. Sure. You know, and there's this guy on the internet who uh, called Lincoln Kareem who lives in New York and he does many things in exposing agendas. <laughs> and one of them is he follows emergency vehicles in a city 
and shows that every once in a while, they turn on their lights, drive around town, creating hysteria and go nowhere. They drive in circles. They stop, get a coffee and a donut. Um, Interesting. And, so in other words, yes. they're not, their lights and sirens are on, but they're not on a call. They're just randomly turning them on. Well, yes, it it seems like they're driving around when there isn't. Well, now, hang on. I'm going to challenge that. And then I did want to comment about what you said something earlier. Um, so that's that's I'm not saying that that's not true. I absolutely believe that's true. But here's the question. Is, is that the case because they're being told to do this? Or is that the case because there's not much perks to being an ambulance driver except waiting for an ambulance? And even me and my friends used to throw pickles at the clock at work. Do you see what I'm saying? To see who would stick to what number. And I would say that if I was an ambulance driver every now and then, I might just throw on the switch and go through the red light <laughs> just because it's fun. Yes. You know what I mean? So, yes. In fact, you know, I okay. I'm just saying there's another possibility. It may be just a sequence of the way humans behave, meaning of life stuff that we associate patterns to that are just unassociated. We're not recognizing typical human behavior when these things are happening. So we equate it to a bigger agenda, much like the black sedan phenomenon that happens in our brains. We only have to have that experience once and we'll create it for ourselves over and over and over again. Exactly. And I, I, I would take it even further. If okay. I, if I was the owner of a city, I would order my emergency vehicles to routinely drive around town and be on Probably, the way. Just to check the equipment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that way they don't even realize they're participating and they don't get in trouble and it's fun and it plays on, it uses both. And, and of course, that's just as plausible. It really depends on you know, what side do you believe? Oh, in the meaning of life, this is where Ulick and I have an opposite stance, whereas he believes that there's more orchestration and I believe that there's not. I believe that more is not orchestrated than is. And it's just happening to line up because of the age we are. And our normal behavior is at double digits. Ex exactly why we would be sitting in this position where we're unsure, rather we're in Do you know when we go back and we tell stories from when we were younger and it, it, and we tell it from this, this um, perspective of afterthought. And so even though we might've done something really cool at the moment, we have no idea why. I have no fucking idea why I said that to her. I knew she was gonna punch me in the face and still it came out of my mouth. And so was that me that, that swapped that experience there where you know she didn't hit me and she was humiliated or whatever from whatever I said? Do I tell it from a state of, I do. I say, I don't know the fuck why. But later on, I connect the dots and I go, now I know why, because know thyself. I, I was raised to be funny. Funny kept me out of getting hit. Funny, you know, having a sense of humor about my life, not being connected to people. All these environmental issues that happened to me turned me into the smart mouth that I became that day. Do you see what I'm saying? So I, I acted, yes with intent because it was the building blocks of where I was at that exact moment. And also with unintentional, I had no idea why I did that at the moment. It had already come out of my mouth before I realized what I was saying. You know what I you mean? You know what? I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yay. And I would encourage you to continue to be that way until you die. <laughs> I'm going to have to be because I've tried so hard to be something else and I cannot. It does not matter how much I stifle it. When the stupid woman at church says something, I cannot keep my mouth from saying something mean back after a while, after a while, you know, I'm not an ass, but at some point, what the fuck did you just say comes out of my mouth, you know, like some kind of challenge to the 
to the comment that's made. And I always think back that was stupid. And then I'm kicked off the church board and they don't want me back because I just won't go along. You know, <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yep. You know, it's funny. And I can't. Um, You're right. I will never be able to, even if I agree with you, I'm going to ask a separate question. I'm going to go, well, do you really think that's the smartest thing we should spend the money on? I'm still going to want to stop in the juror box and ask, are you sure we want to just vote guilty? Can we not think about it for a minute? Well, you saw him with the ax. You saw him with the glove. I know. I know. But that's a, that's a big choice I'm about to make. I got to be really sure. You know, look at I, all the angles. <laughs> yes. Again, I, I'd encourage you to stay that way and share that with younger folks. That's it. <laughs> Okay, so now, okay, um, I do want to answer Punk's question because I also want to present it to you as well. I think it's a great question he asked earlier on and last, so he did remember. So that gives him major props. He just got a check mark in my little black book. <laughs> Punk's <laughs> came back and asked the same question. I love that. Um, um, what about why did why did we stop becoming Christians? Well, um, I'll, do you want to answer that first? Ultimately, I, 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 I want to understand it based on our agreements or our assumptions. So what is a Christian? So if punks can define what a Christian is, I oh, could answer it. Maybe because, because, <laughs> because according to Muslims, I'm a Muslim. And, <laughs> and we all are. And okay, well, according let me to Christians, it. okay, let me do it. Let me define it because this is exactly how I took the question. So he can tell me if I'm wrong. He can either say yes or no. I defined it as somebody who went to church, read their Bibles, said their prayers, and believed in a Christ coming into your heart, the little prayer you do, and then you are born again into, you know, those who died on the cross. I'm assuming he means the Bible Belt version of Christianity because there's a lot of other Christianities out there, including what you said and Catholicism and all of these things. And they don't fall in the same. Maybe they do. I don't know. But my interpretation <clears throat> was, you know, that church, but that was my experience. So it is completely confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he says it's a it's a Christian of disciple. Yes. Okay, then I was right. Here's why I stopped being a Christian. They are liars, thieves, hypocrites, pedophiles. They're disgusting people, disciples of Christ. I wish not to be one of them. That's why anyone who puts that label or that banner of love over their head scare the fuck out of me. And I lived amongst them and was one of them. I was a real disciple of Christ, if you will. And what I realized was what a load of horseshit. I've been worshiping the wrong God. And I still believe in Christ. And I still believe in Christ behaviors because the meaning of life says Christ was our fourth stage. He was... He was the one that showed us the way, in, in a sense, him and those like him around the world. They were a preschooler in a toddler world, and they showed up and they said, come on, guys, stop shitting in your pants and stop doing this. You can be nice. You don't need to bite each other and you don't need to hit each other. We can get along. We can play board games. Look how much fun preschool is. And that's where I see their archetype coming in. And same as now, or you you have, but but the problem today is is that when that that because that toddler into preschool is the last of the rebellion for that stage. We only have so many rebellions in our lives, three to be exact. And our first one is at three, the age three, where we absolutely challenge everything. We are we have just climbed over all of the other kids in the daycare center to get to this point and now the world has become a no. Everybody keeps telling me, no, don't fight, don't hit, don't touch that, don't do this, don't, no, 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 no. My world is full of no's. I want a world full of yeses. And so they start challenging the no's to see where the yeses are. And that's where we got with Christ. 
that that was what that era represented for us in a epochal timeline our first rebellion and then our second rebellion comes in our adolescent years when we stand up to self we stand up once again to claim myself as a unique individual past my elementary school years and now I have a, a, a mind and a thought and that's why be, friends split at this point because playing ball is not enough to keep them together. Really good play ballers go this way and the ones that couldn't play so much join the chess club. And so you have another rebellion, a, a deciding of self, a challenging of the rules to see where you fit, what's okay and what isn't. And the only time this happens again for us in the big scheme of things is during our midlife crisis or when you're moving into your elderhood and you're starting to do the exact same behavior. So we only get three shots to say no to whatever is oppressing us. And it's every time it's going to get harder. When we hit our midlife crisis, it's a real full sack of shit. You've wasted another 20, 30 years of your life just in shit, wasting it for what? Some woman to have all of your stuff or some boss to be treating you badly. It's the next time we challenge all these things. It's much harder to dig out. It's easier now in your adolescence years. It's easier if you don't, you don't say no now, you're stuck in lockers. And, and that's where I think we are. And so we're in a room, not only are we supposed to be stepping outside and finding our place we're surrounded by every other kid in the school who is also with this behavior which means you become nothing but a whisper in the wind and that's why you're gonna say you're gonna be that kid in the back table all by yourself you're a winona rider and out of a, a room full of heathers and you're either gonna be her who has some empathy but still can't stand the world, or you're going to be him who has none and wants to blow it up. Maybe the two of you will work together because, again, I don't think you have a choice. There's my dissertation. I now hand the mic. Thank you. You know what? I would love to be able to roll back the tape. Practically every sentence he stated, um, I'd love, and I could go on and on, and I I. I, I don't know whether I'm a Christian or not, according to common parlance, and I don't know if my dictionary is better than Punk's dictionary, or but it certainly is very big. So if I threw it at him, maybe it would kill him. And I don't know, but I'm not smart enough at this stage to know whether I'm a Christian. And so I would like to... Um, share my thoughts and what I like and what I don't like. And maybe punks can tell me if I'm a Christian and I'm going to get a little bit personal here, but I really love a lot of what you said. I, um, I want to uh, just piece apart. One thing that you said is the yeses and the nos. Mm -hmm. I encourage all Christians or people who think they're Christian and like to tell people that they're Christian to learn what non-Christians believe and say about Christ. Now, there's a lot of people who do not identify themselves as Christian who believe Jesus was real. And I'll give you a few examples. There, Muslims believe Jesus is real. Jews believe Jesus is real. They won't, they won't, publicly make he a big wasn't deal about it. Coming, though. They do believe he's real, but he's not That's the, right. second, not the That's Jesus right. prophesied. That's right. Okay. Yes. And there's a lot of Hindus who believe Jesus is real. Now, if only for comic relief, I would encourage Christians to learn what Hindus believe about Jesus and Jews believe about Jesus and Muslims believe about Jesus and put it all together and identify the yeses and the noes. Identify what they all believe is common and identify where they disagree. And then look at all the Christians or the Bible thumpers or whatever who identify as Christians and try to identify where they disagree on their theology and 
compare it to where they all happen to agree. So this is, it comes down to one thing, kind of like the way you said it, the Bible. Okay. Now, um, I would like to ask self-described Christians who are Bible thumpers or Bible believing Christians. Um, if we were to roll back the tape and go back in time to the year 340, whatever it was, when the Roman Empire, or the Roman Emperor at the time got all the bishops together and killed off the ones who didn't want to agree with them and told them to come up with a book. And these bishops had to determine which of these books and letters and scriptures, whatever, to include and which ones to exclude from the Bible that you're reading today and ask them, do they agree with all these decisions? And if all, if the Roman emperor of today, or if all of our smart clerics of all the denominations of Christianity in the world today were to come together again and decide to revamp that and uh, take, take some books out of the Bible and put some more in, just update the Bible's version or whatever, would you agree with them? Or would you maybe question their decisions? Because ultimately, what I see as Christian or Christianity is a hodgepodge where there's a lot of agreement and there's a lot of disagreement. And ultimately, I take comfort in the fact that the stories we're told is that Jesus never wrote anything down. The only time that he is witnessed to have written anything is when he's doodling in the sand to show the Pharisees who are asking him stupid questions, to show them that he was bored with their stupid questions. That's the only testimony or witness that we have of him writing. And I take great comfort in that story. And the yes, yes and the and well, there's can a, we not can we not just agree that the Bible is there the same way we have stories today, we have always done. And so we can just chalk that up to more of a docu-series yeah. as opposed to a actual event. Um yes. you know. Mm hmm. And so to me, the Bible's the docuseries. It should be used for historical purposes alongside the rest of them. And, you know, decoding using the meaning of life scale. And then you start to see some really interesting things showing up. Yes. And I, I encourage Christians it's to template. recognize. Sorry. The, the meaning of life is a template. Yep. Mm. Yep. And. I encourage Christians to ask, why are these educated clerics, whether they're from one Christian denomination or another, why are they devoting their entire life to creating books and stories when you and I can enjoy very simple things in life the way the vast majority of the human race has given the opportunity and the vast majority of the human race cannot read. So That's whatever power that was what yes. the world gave them going back to Oracle. So I want to kind of loop around. Yes. For a second. yes. Um, so when I researched into Oracles, what I had discovered is, um, well, let me, let me mark this because I need to say something else. Okay, oracles. Okay, let me let me pin that for just a second. What was the thing we were talking about before? Uh, right before I said oracles. Well, I was telling people that most people in the entire oh. history of mankind cannot read. Right. So what, whatever, whatever. Yes. Okay, I got it pinned. Now I've written it down. Okay, 
going back to the original question, so about where this, I just wanted to point out where I had an actual, you know, moment of third eye opening. I blinked, if you will. I was sitting, I was at chapel, sitting in chapel and because you had to go every Tuesday and Thursday and Sunday, unless you knew somebody in the office and converted to Catholicism. So you didn't have to, that's a true story. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's how much I hated church. <laughs> um, I could go to the Catholic church and be saved and sanctified within an hour. Just have to have a little thing signed once a month that I go regularly. Right. Or I had to go to chapel where they scan your, if you're not there, you're, you're fucked. Right. <laughs> and that took two and a half hours. <laughs> So I thought about it for a second and I thought, hmm, I know someone in the chapel office. Her name is Jana. And she went, sure, you're Catholic. And I said, I sure am. <laughs> Check. <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> I got out of that. That saved me an hour and a half every Sunday. Um, <clears throat> But I was at a Church of God university. I wasn't raised Church of God. Church of God was very Pentecostal and I wasn't raised Pentecostal. So these two things during my adolescent years collided greatly and I found myself in quite a conundrum. <laughs> so before my adolescent years, before Pentecostal, I loved Jesus. I loved going to church. I loved everything about the Lord and the Bible and the whole nine yards. I, I loved singing hymns. My experience in the world of, of Christianity was absolutely magical. Okay. Jesus saved me. Every time something scared me, I just had to say, Satan, get away from me. And he would real quick too. It worked for me. All the magic worked for me. Okay. Then Pentecostal shows up and it changes everything. I think I am uncomfortable now. I can't be in church. I feel like I shouldn't belong there. I feel like a fish out of water. Now, here's some interesting things. As I was going into my adolescence, all of the traumas I'd previously experienced started to stack onto me as you hit puberty. Now, this isn't me saying this. This is everything I've researched and studied about know thyself. So as I'm hitting my puberty, I'm getting my DNA, my genetic whatever thing is being triggered on. And I'm starting to feel dizzy, lightheaded, blacking out. I have syncope. And the first signs of it start during my puberty. And every time I would be standing in those long church of Pentecostal singings for an hour and a half, I'd start to black out. I'd start to feel sick. I'd go to the bathroom and throw up. Now, you know how conflicting that must be to a 13-year-old girl. I'm trying to decide if I'm possessed by the devil is some reason why I can't be in church. And my body is working against me. And all of these things stack up until I finally get to college. And I'm at a church of God, you know, you know, college. It's a university now, but college. And every time I'm there, I'm sick from standing. I'm getting dizzy and lightheaded. I cannot even stand for any of their dumb ass two hour long sing along singathons that they would do. Do you see? And I become a verse naturally. My body's telling me you don't belong here. <laughs> do you see what I mean? I do. I, now, if I, so oh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but okay, I want to offer an opinion. Now, I, I got to warn you that um, I my opinion is somewhat, it, it is supernatural in that you you don't belong there you're right you got the right, right message that's, that's the message that's, yes that's right that's what it took for you to understand that these traditions mm. these the, this 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 culture the brainwashing and the methodology of the brainwashing it's yes. essentially a, a mantra. It's like getting everybody into this hypnotic state of whatever it is. Okay. Um, that's what it took for you to get the message that this is wrong and that you don't belong there. Maybe these sheep belong there. Maybe they do. They can handle but the club. You don't. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, I, I want to. I gotta be low, same. low, low to the ground. <laughs> She's going out. <laughs> Praise yes. Jesus. <laughs> yes, that's that's what it took 
for you to get the message. Now, I'm, I believe that message was sent to you, but it doesn't have to be. Now, you asked about who are these prophets and oracles? What was the physical thing that was happening? I would like to suggest that, in my opinion, most of these prophets were simply intelligent people and that they were surrounded by retards, by inbred, mentally retarded sheep. Well, that's true. <laughs> I, 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 I mean that quite delicate, uh, quite seriously, and I want to be delicate about it, but I can't. And I would encourage people to look at their scriptures, whether it's the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, even, uh, I, I hate divide, creating dividing lines, but even Hindu and um and muslim quran okay and read it and take a few step back steps back and ask who is the intended audience like who needs to read this like who needs to read all this in order to get the message because jesus never wrote anything down and muhammad was illiterate to me i take a lot of uh comfort in the fact that these people were not sending a message through the written word. They were trying to send a message through setting an example. Okay. And so perhaps this, uh, these scriptures are designed and they were manipulated over the years and rewritten and recrafted so that slave masters can keep their slaves in line. And it was done with a, the the best image, and the intention was wrong. But the way they operate is that the well, uh, forgive me for using this magical terminology, but the devil appears as an angel. Mm -hmm. The devil has the most beautiful music. Like the uh, the Catholic uh, missionaries would go off into native land, you know, foreign lands with a flute or a violin, and they would play their music to lure all it the hurts. natives in. Did they play some hurts, and it would oh, hurt yes. people. <laughs> exactly, and so ultimately. Who is the intended audience of these scriptures? Because we can read the entire Bible and we okay, can okay. all the, the bad probably, people. Let me say this. It's going back to the meaning of life. Now, when we reach our three-year toddler years, we're now getting the ability to sit still and listen to a story. And that's where our fairy tales and, and you know, we've, we've gone past the three, you know, we start doing the three little pigs and we start out with the nursery rhymes is what I was looking for. And then we move to the fairy tales. Now, what do nursery rhymes and fairy tales have in common? They are small, short ways of explaining a moral dilemma. And, and to the toddler or the young preschooler's mind, it's an all an unconscious concept there. And so that, the Bible being nothing, and, and any ancient text, any of them from anywhere, so outside the Bible, all of them coming from these same areas, these are the, the nursery rhymes and the fairy tales of the written of what we have access to. The same reason why we have these crazy stories about Thor and Zeus, right? These are these are a natural phenomenon that the human mind does at a specific age and time. And they all happen to come out when you use the meaning of life scale right at our preschool toddler era. That is our ancient times. That's pre their toddler is ancient. Imagine that you're building with big blocks and things. So for these written word and these written scriptures to come out of that time, that I would expect that. I could have I could have predicted that. Had I had I had this beforehand, I would have said, "Oh, hey, right here everybody's going to start writing stuff and hiding it in bookshelves. I mean, jars. It's a behavior we would naturally have." So the manipulation out of it, 
again, this is where I tend to disagree with this side of things. I don't know if the intent was there or if it just was accidental because the behavior is there. So are they acting with the, in a hundred thousand years, I'm going to have this. I don't think they were yet. I still don't think they were yet. I don't think the intent began until they started recognizing the pattern of generational archetypes. And then we got the manipulation. So if the book was published in 1990, uh, in the science, you know, 1991, it was published. Then I must go back law of three, 30, 60, 90, multiply that by three, because they already know that rule from before. That's uh, what, nine times three, 180 years? No, is that correct? Yeah, no. Three, how many? I'm not. <laughs> yes, I homeschool. <laughs> you should be praying. Um, you know what I'm saying? They, that's how long that we can, I can accept a manipulation taking place. So at that point, I'll go, okay, now I'll accept it. And this puts us into more of the king, queen, empires type eras where we started elementary school, where where we started manipulating through some of that pattern of the recy- the, re- the stories being retold. And I think that's kind of a Shakespeare-esque lure there where, where it said we're all a stage and you're just playing a part because you're, you will. Generational archetypes is a thing. We can pattern it throughout our historical, you know, and it, and it plays alongside our developmental stages, which is why I found it to be a very important layer there. So, so I don't know how I did. My thinking would be that it didn't begin to be intentional until around the industrial era or before that, you know, where we started to have business show up and fraternities and universities and and these types of things were happening. I believe that's when we started to have the manipulation towards, yes, educating everyone because it is bad for them to read unless they're reading my shit. (laughs) Brilliant devil. (laughs) You've done it again. Oh, saint one. (laughs) Forgive me, but I disagree totally. Okay, that's I, fair. I, that's okay. my on the meaning of life. I don't believe we've been doing it. For, but you're fair to disagree. I don't have any. This, you look and I disagree oftentimes in this exact position. So anyone is welcome to argue. I'd love to be wrong. I'd love to think that it's all intentional and I can somehow just say no to him and he'll go away. I just don't think that it is. But yeah. Just to, just to be clear that I'm understanding, you're saying that if we were to go back in time long ago, the richest of the richest people with the biggest swords and knives and weapons were not in cahoots against the poor people the way they yeah, are. No, I'm saying, no, I see where you got caught on me. Okay. Um, pull my skirt up a little higher. There you go. Now grab there where I think, the difference is is that when you're when you're in our early stages of colluding between kingdoms or whatever that's like two two kids getting together to steal a ball it, it's it's just where we start to practice playing in pairs because first it's all about me and everything is me and then as i start to develop and i hit Three, I can start playing in pairs. I can now have the ability to go and take turns. When I reach four, I have the ability to take turns in threes. And when I reach five, I can now play a cohesive group. That's why board games typically start around age five and six, because pre that, the ability to maintain your lane is impossible. The brain is just not there yet. So in our ancient times, when you're talking about a couple tribes getting together and these things, of course, those behaviors happened. And very largely because this is a micro macro experience we're having. But we also had that behavior. However, we weren't thinking about 
collectively UN type taking over the entire world until much later in our development where we begin to take over into gangs and we start taking over ball fields, which is where we're at now. I we're colluding I, with everybody, I, everyone in the it's do or die switch. So are you a jet or are you a shark? Mm -hmm. I I agree with you. Now okay. for me, the you ultimate, better no, just kidding. <laughs> well the, for me it the the sort of convincing proof of exactly that <laughs> is um finally the 2020 microbiological scam to see the Pope tell everybody that getting Vaseline is an act of love, that that sealed the deal for me. Yeah, these are, just, but that's all happened recently. These are all yes. that are still, when we started listening to the Pope, when the whole world said when they infected enough people with their venom and we all jumped on board i'm an american right and you're a canadian right and so we're all one in these ways we're all now that's when i think we started seeing the intent behind it 300 years to make a slave these are intense even even as far as like the machiavellian all of that era all of that is is the era of these are every every historical year we go by is a second on our epochal clock our biological clock so thousands of years go by and i may only be 10 years old or i may be just going through that specific stage so my behaviors are are all in that era that's where like age of Aquarius and these types of ideas is a little bit more comfortable because you can just basically say the whole time that's going on through the astrological clock that we're in the age of Pisces, all of these behaviors are being, you know, seen. You'll see some that are a little bit further, but they're still in a time where the, like currently, you know, I might be thinking like a 12 year old, but I seem to be surrounded by a bunch of nine year olds with nine-year-old behavior where poop is funny and kicking each other's in the nuts is funny. I'm not in mature group here, <laughs> you know, as if you're a fish out of water or off placed an old soul, they call it. Yes. And I, I, yeah. So for me, I just think that's when we started to see the behaviors of collusion where the real that 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 idea of generational i can control the wars now they just happen to happen because we're kids and every three days we have to have a temper tantrum but guess what i now recognize that and i can control that temper tantrum for my own gain so maybe i don't have the temper tantrum every day i only have it when i want a chocolate bar and i know it works on mom because she's tired and ready to get out of the store do you see what i'm saying and so the pattern starts being practiced on it starts getting played with and, and there you go. You now have a, a greater understanding of the world. And if I work together, if the three of us work together, we could take over that entire continent. You can have the top half, you can have the middle, and I'll have the bottom. Yes, I believe um, this that dynamic has always existed, and it goes in cycles, and happens at different stages and rates in different places of the world. So on the other end of the, the, the earth, they could be filled with a bunch of kids. And where we are, we could be at a different sort of evolutionary stage of maturity within our tribe or family. So it's not uniform throughout the entire world at any one time and when you say you're an old soul um I, I i i gotta link this in to reincarnation um and i i i can't resist but johnny cash sang a song called were you there when they crucified my lord and 
I encourage folks to 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 listen to all of Johnny Cash's music, but <laughs> but try to contemplate what does that nursery tale or song mean? What could it possibly mean to ask that question? And the reason um, I, I really do think that it would be wise for Christians modern Christians, to look at the connections between all the different faiths. And reincarnation is a, a tenant that is kept secret. When John the Baptist appeared, the, he was asked if he is Elijah. See, the Jews believe that, just as you said, Joni, you've got three chances. Remember? Well, that's what the Jews believe. They believe that we are given three chances to right whatever we did wrong before we're condemned. And mm, I'll play along, Shark. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying this is true or not, but that's what the scriptures say. And I, I, I love Johnny Cash so much, but <laughs> um, the, the, the folk song was written with some intent, I presume. So when we ask, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The question is, I believe, eliciting the concept of reincarnation. And I believe that all of these evil, evil clerics are believe in reincarnation and they believe that they can come back and continue evil. Just like we can come back and become better and better, we don't have to. And the reason why they go through so much effort into writing scriptures is so that they can hide these secrets to their future generation. And I, I want to lead this up to something that you just said, and that's about controlling the world. You can't, you can't control the world. You can't control a tribe or whatever. What can you control? And where does the lack of control um, pose a problem? You can control your family, right? That's the limits of where your control over society, in my opinion, should end. You should control your kids and balance that with teaching and lead them to grow up past the meaning of life and become adults. But what you mm -hmm. cannot control is you, you cannot control your son or your daughter falling in love with a bad guy. True. That's where your yeah, control that's, that's, that's where your control ends. I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> Yes, of course. I'll but let you know how it turns out, but I'm on the road to That's right. <laughs> but, but, but that's that's the challenge of all parents, um, or one of the, the few. Um, but ultimately, if your daughter comes home with a rocket scientist, what do you do? Uh, my parents had that dilemma. Oh, my he's God. <laughs> he's at university going... He's perfect. He's not. See, that's the trick. Or being a rock band. <laughs> you did it, girl. <laughs> that's the trick. See, that's oh, the trick. Man. Okay. See, so... that. <clears throat> so all these scriptures are designed, I presume. It, well, leastways, there's different in interpretations, but I believe they provide advice, both good and bad. So that your parents, if they were smart Christians, dare I be so judgmental, <laughs> if they were smart Christians, they would be, they would have been able to maybe um, filter a rocket scientist out of the family or prevent you from getting all tangled up in a bad guy. Just like, you know, every parent would want for their kid. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, the limits of our control in society is our kids falling in love with a bad person. Well, I think that, but that's being manipulated because for so long, and, and here again, though, I'll link it back to generational studies. 
because that goes along with the overprotected, underprotected, overprotected, underprotected pattern that happens within the generations. And so uh, when your your whole surroundings is for for a couple generations has been you know, a, a class ring being, or the football, you know, the the quarterback of the football team being your highest goal, right? And that's how we've, we were been brainwashed into thinking. And now suddenly we're being exposed to the fact that the quarterback is a, a piddler and he likes to rape women in the locker rooms and he's an asshole and he trips the dumb kids. And you know what I'm saying? And he teases and makes fun of people or whatever, is exposed right now, everyone just runs the other way and they find the secluded nerd, right? And then that one ends up being a narcissistic prick. And then we run the other way to the big guy that's going to protect us from the narcissist. I'm going to punch you in the face, you little wimp. And then we're stuck going back and forth between these two, all of which being controlled, all of which one side is controlled and and by default the other side gets controlled as well they lock into each other and people who perhaps are good mates and matches may not be found i i wonder i think that's the you know, I was always told in church not to walk the fence, and and that was bad to be lukewarm, that I had to pick sides. The Bible told me so. And now I absolutely disagree with that. That's the fulcrum point. That's the point at the top of the pyramid where I can see one side when it's down and one side when it's up, and I can stand there with two feet on both sides and see both sides at all times. I never lose eyesight of what's going on. And I'm watching everyone run past me over to that side and then run past me down to that side. And I'm standing lukewarm right in the middle as they pass through me, like a ghost, you know, walking yeah. through worlds. I think that that's, to me, it's a juvenile thinking. I'm not saying that it was a form of manipulation to tell me not to stay away from the fence. I think that that's what parents do to their children when they say, don't look over the fence. In other words, you know, you, I protect my child from the world. For a long time, they're only in my house. We're talking three-dimensional thinking, right? They're just in my location and I have control over who sees them and who they see. But at some point they wander past me into a fourth dimensional world where they can look over the fence and see and they can meet other people and have experiences. The Buddha story, Jesus story, and you meet from all walks. You, you walk amongst the other side for a while. You know, um, it's funny that you mentioned that um, there's this uh, Buddhist uh, or Hindu text that uh, called the Tao Te Ching, um. and it's um, written by Sun Tzu, the guy who wrote that book, The Art of War, and it's uh, it's a text that a lot of people use as a kind of like a Hindu scripture, modern Hindu scripture, and towards the end of it, um, it refers to exactly that, the fence. And it's got what I believe is bad advice. Yeah. And it, it says that essentially the family or the tribe is happy with where they are. They can hear the sounds of the dogs and whatever's going on in the other tribe across, you know, wherever the, the, the river or something, but they do not go there. They're happy staying where they are. And mm -hmm. um, I believe that's bad advice, not just morally, but from a purely scientific perspective, it's the doom of a tribe. Ultimately with enough time, Every single tribe, civilization struggles with the same problem, and that is inbreeding. If a tribe does not mix, does not get outside 
fresh blood, it is doomed to inbreeding and turning into children and retards. And then they end up behaving like animals. Mm -hmm. And so all these scriptures that we have, in my opinion, are uh, a balance between how do you deal with a bunch of people who behave like animals and how do you deal with people who are rising rules. above that? You have to give them rules like 10 commandments and, and constitutional rights. You have to set rules on them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Actually, well, I, I want to bring out too what you were talking about there. Again, I can't help it, meaning of life stuff, because we must move. It, it, to not move is death. My my need to go and mix with them is part of God's mathematical equation to push me outside. So if I won't go on my own accord, it will fuck me up and I'll die, right? Survival of the fittest. If I follow through with my instincts and I begin to crawl, and I start moving, then I eventually continue my life. If I never move from that spot, you're called an invalid and you're going to die. You're going to just whisk the way. But so something in us causes us to do that, to want to meet other people, to be attracted to things that are different. Look, something shiny that is ingrained in us. We are meant to do that. It's part of the equation, I, I think you would just assume that eventually you'd blend in to the same thing. Now that's evolution, if you will, but the idea is that it's in us anyway. We can't avoid it. I can't turn three. I can't stop myself from turning three. I'm going to move unless something prevents me from moving, whether it be fear, whether it be confinement, whether it be disability. I'm going to move. I can't help it. My feet just do it. My knees just scooch. My arms pull me. I'm not in control right now. So the idea that we started to go outside of our tribes or started to exit the Garden of Eden, which is what I think that story represents there. Um, it's a micro story inside of a macro story. And we move outside of, of that 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 area we've become accustomed to and we take a step out. We're on our own now. And you're about to experience what the world is. And in even in it saying, even in it saying that you'll now know what it means to work and you'll now know what childbirth feels like. Of course you will, because if you never move, you'd never experience those things. It's the physical of the movement that gives you those experiences in the first place. You're growing up. You made it outside the first fear of annihilation. Congratulations. Now you get to move on to your next fear. Creepy crawlies, body invasion, body mutilation, because tribes are going to come for you. They're all curious and sniffing around. <laughs> You're out there in the woods hiding from the dogs. Now, the oracle thing. Um, so my research told me this. Now, there is conflicting research. But the reason that I like this is because it goes along with the natural development of the mind, or at least my understanding of it per my research and my personal experiences. But the oracles were traumatized. They were taken away. They were little girls that were taken away or boys taken away. And they were brutally traumatized throughout their childhood, making them lethargic towards the end and on a lot of drugs. And because of this, they were able to skate in the in-between zone or the lucid state where all of these premonitions and thoughts come from in the first place. This uh, near death type experiences, oftentimes they were brutally abused. You know, the same thing we hear happening to celebrities and politicians and Illuminati people's children and themselves as they're traumatized or, or you know, exiled, if you will, because that was Mulder's experience. He was traumatized by the experience of his sister missing, and then he skates between, do you see? So oracles are known to have been traumatized human beings, rather created by man or by the world itself. We'll call that God, an oracle. So that's the reason I kind of liked what he was saying in the sense that it, even if he's off, the idea of 
that area where the frequency of the heartbeat, the brain, whatever is going on reaches these peaks. And this is the experience you have. Possibly, possibly, I'm not saying you can, but possibly capable of tapping into things of the supernatural or unseen realm. And in which case oracles might be able to have in some cases, if it was done right, if I had the ingredients with just the right size newt eyes, I could, in fact, create a connection. Or at least I think I can. And therefore, I'm going to try and whatever crazy thing comes out of her mouth. And because I believe in magic at this age, remember history and everything, I believe in the supernatural by nature. If mom hides that teddy bear behind her back, I have yet to recognize it. It's gone. <laughs> the, the first magic trick ever recorded is the cup and balls by the Egyptians. Now, I find that very interesting. That makes a lot of sense. It goes along with hide and seek and peekaboo. It's the exact behavior that happens. Um, I think, you know, maybe it is possible. Maybe it, it's something. But even if it isn't, all I have to do is think it is uh, possible. And I'll act as the law of manifestation. I'll act in accordance to the oracle telling me I'll win or the oracle telling me I'll lose. Much like the oracle in the matrix saying, would you still have knocked it over if I hadn't have told you? You know, it's funny. Um, the uh, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but the, the the Hindu have very different opinions on what is reality and what is supernatural. They're not a homogeneous bunch theologically. One of their beliefs is a, a like a mother god that they call Maya, and what she does is represents earth or the physical reality and what they see as the physical reality is that we are her children and we're given toys mm -hmm. what we have before us in this earth is just a bunch of toys that she gave us and she sits and watches us play and every single object that we see or every sound that we hear is blocking another object behind it that we cannot see, or yeah. it's, it's, it's preventing another sound that we cannot hear. And so the child at the age of three getting up and moving is changing and interacting with this physical environment and is becoming part of it. Now there's a lot of, parents who have children who are born um, abnormal with ailments of various sorts. And I've, I've encountered some people who have children that don't seem like they're going anywhere, unfortunately. And for them, it was a big deal that the child turned his head towards them. Like it was almost a year before the child actually responded to anybody around it. The kid just sits in its chair doing nothing. And it's sad to hear. I can't imagine what that's like, but not all kids are born the same. And ultimately, you know, those parents have a, a challenge that I and most people can't possibly imagine. But ultimately everything we do changes our environment and the hindus see us as being mother earth's children playing with her toys and the concept of maya has a dual meaning in that it's used to represent illusion so this object before us is creating an illusion by hiding the thing behind it and it's up to us to figure out what is preventing us from seeing and hearing reality or not? And we're cluttered and filled with so much distraction that is either useful, informative, good, bad, or or not. I, it's up to each individual. Doesn't that go that. into the 
realm of like multi-dimensional thinking the way we described it in the past yeah where that's my uh, my next step in my development stage is to pick up the blanket is to crawl around the block to see what is on the other side to challenge the illusion that is happening and during that time i then as a parent create a new illusion so they won't call, fall for the cup you know follow the lady anymore they're not going to do that. So I'm going to change and I'm going to create gods and fairies and tooth fairies and clauses and Easter bunnies. And I start to create, we go from nursery rhymes to fairy tales. And then they still believe that for a while. They still, they'll follow that because you're acting as if, just like when you throw the stick, but don't throw the stick. You act like you're throwing the stick and the dog falls for the trick to that too many times and the dog won't turn around it's it, it'll it'll start to and then turn back oh false one false one you know it starts to learn the trick just like a a kid does and and so wouldn't you say that's that's just a developmental stage that we do now we don't Are fall you? for that one so they've created a new one for us okay you won't fall for that boogity oh they won't fall for the boogity anymore so now I've got yeah. to the ante. And the thing that when I start thinking in this doorway, because I, again, the five fears and what I am conquering and what I have already set out to conquer before I reach this point of not being liked, the boogeyman in the closet or the fear of being confined or trapped, that loss of autonomy, that's all of those fears. That's why bondage was so popular for a while, because it was our release, our expression of the release of the fear of the loss of autonomy. I'm now allowing it because um, for some reason that's in therapy. They were, you know, that's a, a, a form of therapy, almost an immersion like process where you go down in it. And that way you don't have to worry about being as afraid of the snakes anymore you've you've touched the snake and so i think that's what that expression is and you know we had the clown era remember when people were jumping out and clowns again another process of fear we also had a lot of serial killers and mass murderers more of that was being shown to us this is all expressions of exiting the fear of the loss of autonomy and we didn't conquer it. We're all more afraid than ever. So we've actually autonomized ourselves. We've locked ourselves in small rooms like the net. Remember that film or, you know, those types of ideas. The magic only works if you believe it. And the end of the film, she circles herself in the, 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 the tomb. She actually entombs herself because she believed what they were saying was true. That's the skeleton key. And I think that's what we're experiencing now. A lot of people are locking themselves in through all of these technologies. And they don't even realize that they fell for it. And a few of us have to stretch and get out as much as we can. You know, I don't leave my house, but I'm certainly not trapped. I can go outside in a very large wooded area. I do that often. I don't go to the city. Those feel very confined. That's claustrophobic, you know. Some believe, people say I'm agoraphobic, but in reality, I'm claustrophobic. I don't like small spaces. I want to be able to breathe. I don't like hands around my neck or feeling like I can't catch my breath for so many fireworks going off. I'm just consistently in a state of high alert in those areas, you know. And there's, so we're getting that divide with people. We're having people that need the security of the city. They need that. But then this other group says, fuck that. I can't live there. City mouse, country mouse stories coming out in real life. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the development of all these nursery tales and yeah, nesting and, and um, boogeyman essentially uh, mm. become uh, a means of controlling the mind. So instead of physically, if, instead of physically controlling people in confined spaces, the what I would call the bad guys of the world <laughs> are using mind control with magic 
spells and just to to keep us stupid, essentially, and fearing things that may or may not exist. And right. ultimately, well, as an anarchist, I like linking this up to the concept of government. The word being um, derived from Latin to govern the mense or the mind. And that's essentially how all these great big organizations operate. They convince us of stuff and then they do something else in the background. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, isn't and they that keep the us in line. Having a, a, um, a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that goes back to my experience from my Christianness. I was sitting in church one day or in in chapel um, on a Tuesday or Thursday morning for two hours now between classes. <laughs> Just the class before me, I sat behind or in, probably behind a couple of girls who before class and after class is getting their bags were discussing their sinful activities from the night before. And then I happened to get right behind them in chapel that morning and they're raising their hands. They're speaking in tongues. They're disgusting is what they are. And I sat there and I thought to myself, if these people can be so forgiven and filled with the spirit within seconds after just giggling about their excursion, something's fucked up here. They're either false or the God is false. One of these things is wrong, you know. One of these things is not like the others, and well, that's putting on an act. That's exactly what I saw. I saw fakers, and that changed me right there. And that's when I said, "I don't. I'm not fake. I was an opposer before, and I'm not a faker now." <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I'm not going to claim those archetypes. That doesn't belong to me. Not that I haven't been fake. And not that I haven't acted like a poser. That is not me. You know, I've also shoplifted, but I'm not a shoplifter. Do you see what I'm saying? I've tried on the coat, but I don't stay in the department. <laughs> I don't own more than one. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, you, you lived for another day and you either try to be better or you learn how to be worse at being bad or better at being bad or whatever. We're given a choice. And ultimately, um, what you saw could have been a message that there's a lot of, whether it's Christian or other religious folks, who are fake. They're putting on a costume to disguise or hide whatever, and they're going with the flow like Jesus the fish. rest of the animals. Yeah. They put on a and, Jesus fish. And then tell yeah. me, go against the flow. I mean, the psyop <laughs> that's played there. I'm a Jesus fish. Go with the flow. But that's that's the wrong religion. In Christianity, we go against the flow. Remember, we're the men. We're the small minority amongst the many pagans. And now, if you go, I'm still going against the flow. Everybody turned around on me. Do you see what I mean? I was just swimming along and. They turned around on me <laughs> and I'm still swimming against the flow now. You know, it's just, I, I still don't understand. I thought we were going along here and now suddenly I don't recognize anyone. I can't find a Christian on the planet to save my life. You know, I didn't even know what that means anymore. All I see is demons. I don't even see anyone talking about angels. The whole world is just full of demons and monsters. There's no angels in the world. Where is that? If the angels existed, wouldn't they be here already? Would I be one? Am I supposed to sprout wings like an X-Man and become an angel and everyone's going to just do whatever I say? That's ridiculous. None of that can exist because it makes no sense. None of that makes any sense. You have to be your own angel or you're your own devil. Just you by yourself. You you pick sides, whatever it is. I would like to offer a theory and maybe some advice. First of all, I, I, I want to just continue with what you just said. You can be an angel yourself and you can be angelic to somebody else. You can be the angel for somebody else. Uh -huh. And that you leads can. Me to what 
my flashback and when I had my near death experience or one of them and I had my review of my life, I didn't see all the bad things I did. I saw every tiny thing I did, things that I, nobody else even knew existed. I wasn't one that went around and said, hey, guess what I did last Tuesday? Uh, I saw all of these really cool things that I had done, none of the bad ones. And and I couldn't find anyone at the time who had the same experience. And anytime I'd mentioned it, everybody told me I was kooky anyway. So I was just like, fine. But recently I came across one where I heard a guy mention the exact same thing. I didn't see. It was some great philosopher, not philosopher, maybe a monk or something. I don't know. Somebody wrote something, but I had just came across it. <clears throat> I didn't. I saw all the good things I'd done. And I thought, well, see, so did I. And know thyself. I chalked that up to the fact that every time I did something wrong, I felt so much guilt at the moment after like that. Why am I not one who continued behaviors? Because they made me feel bad. I felt bad. I didn't feel good and I couldn't let it go. And for years and years, I shopped at the bookstore that I stole from so that I could repay my penance. That's how guilty I felt. Till one day I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> It was just Shakespeare's sonnets for crying out loud. You know, that's what I stole, but that's what I did. I, and and so you, you beat yourself up. I, I recognized my foul behavior at the moment. I realized it didn't make me feel real well, even though I could get away with it. Some things did, though. I didn't feel bad skipping school. I'll tell you that. Other things I did, I didn't feel bad about. But these particular things I felt kind of bad about. And so when I had my experience, I don't need to go back. I think that's where that, sa that saying no regrets has to come from. I used to have a boyfriend who would say that constantly to me. I I'd say, well, that didn't work out. I'd be like, no regrets, no regrets, nothing, nothing that ever happens to you. Feel bad about. It's just you being you. It's just you doing what you do. And, and that's how I always took that. And so maybe the world is full of a lot of people who just don't feel bad about it. They feel like they can justify it in some way. And because of that, that's why they experience that. More people do. I don't know. These are just my theories at the moment. I'd like to share a, a wacky theory along okay. the same lines. Um, I'm going to springboard again from, from Asia. The, the Hindu... Um, the, the Hindu present the world with a particular perspective comparing us to animals. So the, my question is, when the bird or the eagle swoops down and grabs a rabbit and tears it apart and eats it, or the bird uh, eats a worm, is the worm, the, is the worm suffering? Perhaps. Is the rabbit suffering? Yes. Is the eagle doing, committing an act of evil? Does right. the eagle think in terms of doing something bad? Oh, I better not do that next time. The eagle doesn't. Yeah. Like, you see? So we differentiate ourselves from the animal kingdom in many different ways. I would suggest exactly what you said you feeling bad at the time is a distinction that some people may not have. And my theory is that we are human animal hybrids and that we have a mix between a human spirit and an animal spirit. And it's up to us to balance the two or fight one or not fight the one, embrace one, or not embrace the one. But I observe people behaving like animals. But I think that's normal for their age. I think that's typical of double digits and that late elementary school, you know, where, where you know, you start to have that pulling, you're pulling butterfly wings off. You're, you're pulling the legs off. You're not, you're not thinking of these things. You know, you're poking sticks and setting ants on fire with magnifying glasses pulling yes, out but your phones you're... and watching mm -hmm. fight but... fight fight and everybody comes running yes and but some people never grow up some people spend their entire lives the comes into the the Sorry, werewolf, 
the werewolf, mm -hmm. the monster they're coming into from the the adolescent stage. There's um, the the wolf, you know, the wolf dog man. All yep. of those fairy tales are coming from an adolescent type stage there. Um, the yep. X-Men even, um, mutate, mutant ninja turtles. They're teenage mutant ninja turtles. <laughs> It's, it's a, sign, a signature for puberty or a change. This animalistic thing, you can't help yourself. She is making out with you and you're, you are feeling you can't help yourself. And some of you push to the limit and you end up in date rape charges. Do you see what I'm saying? And every, yep. every teenager remembers a moment, boy or girl, where they couldn't stop themselves. And if the kid had said, no, you would have, you know, not everybody would do it in an abusive manner. But, you know, come on, come on. I got blue balls now. You try, you'll plead, you'll do anything. You know, and not everyone takes it to the extreme, but every kid knows that moment where they feel the begging urge. Where you yes, could, it, could transform if the moon was in its fullness. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. And I think it's, I, I would encourage people to, consider animal behavior that isn't imposing and isn't coercive or isn't aggressive. And that is the sheep. Okay. The sheep just goes along with the flow, just like the fish goes with the flow, doesn't think. Okay. The, the, the farm animal doesn't think in terms of the doctor being a veterinarian. They think of the doctor as providing health care. They don't think of the... Or do they the, think of the doctor as a pain in the ass? I mean, what do that's they? That's right. You know, cats and dogs don't want to go to the veterinarian. They don't see it as a helpful thing, neither do children. So they see it as a... I see animals as in that childlike mind, which makes sense. Yeah. Most people treat their animals like children. And I think it's because they reside in that... They, they don't understand. They don't. They don't go, oh, thank God that person has poked me. They don't ever think that. No babies thought that. No toddlers thought that. No child thinks that. It's only until they reach their preschool and school age that they start to recognize the benefits. The doctor, I know it's going to hurt to go to the dentist, but we've got to get our teeth. You can rationalize with an older child in ways you can't with a younger. Dogs can't be rationalized with. I can't. Well, it's for your own good. And then all of a sudden the dog jumps in the car. No, you're dragging their ass. You know, I, I, I want to also add the converse and that is some people treat their children as animals mm -hmm. and they never stop that and since you know the concept of, or the dogs and wolves have been brought up um i would like to give some advice to anybody who's a dog owner and that is to take dog training courses and classes and more specifically there's different philosophies of dog training there's philosophies of coercive dog training where dogs are pulled on a leash and beaten or <laughs> physically, you know, yeah, and then there's and rolled up newspapers. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. And then there's what I would recommend non coercive dog training, which is reward based. So there's markers and rewards. And so using the Pavlovian reflex, dogs are trained to perform certain behaviors with the concept of a reward up until they don't need the reward. Ultimately, the idea is non-coercive. Now, it's, it is a level of brainwashing the dog, but it's not forceful. And I, in my experience, it's fun. And it helps understand human behavior and distinguish people who think and behave like sheep because they were trained to respond to certain things and people who recognize brainwashing and try to look over the fence. But I, I forgive me for, for tying this in with the, the God helmet guys um, storm theory of human behavior, but I, I, I really do believe that what we observe with these electromagnetic storms is that 
something is triggered in everybody's brain to be anxious. And everybody's individual anxiety um, becomes a real fear. So everybody's boogeyman comes out and they, everybody acts squirrely. And it is a Pavlovian response, sort of, because these fears come about from previous experiences, rightly or wrongly or real or fake. But ultimately, we do have an animalistic behavior where we respond to triggers. Well, um, yes. But I still don't know if it's intentional. Oh, that I don't know. That, 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 that's totally, and it, I don't think it matters. I believe that over the years, prophets and oracles were in the know. They recognize that everybody acts squirrely when a, a, an impending storm is coming about. Okay, so then that goes back to the idea of trauma creating problems for the human being. Absolutely. And, and I, um, cre the crazy making, a trauma bonding, all, we're all in it together. Are those sirens you hear? We're in it together. Call 1-800-CRIME-STOPPERS. I, I roll it back to how children are raised. And I believe we're in a culture of child abuse where our parents and our grandparents were given models of parenting that was neglectful, abusive, uh, stupid, and essentially brain control. Essentially, our parents were our first brainwashers, for better or for worse. And how but were they brainwashed? From their oh, parents. How were exactly. they brainwashed from their parents? And who did that? Newspapers. Movies. Exactly. Commercials. You know, once we moved in commercials. Once we moved into the industrial age, the stage was set for the manipulation. I'll allow it there, but I can't allow it before that. Because we, you know, it was word of mouth. We were all influenced. Just le reading the Ingalls series. And they talked about the guy that came to the house that that does the, the cobbler. And he, he was just one of the examples. He travels from home to home. And when he shows up, he makes everyone shoes, hangs out for a while, the storyteller. And he told stories about what was going on in town. And everyone loved when the cobbler came to town. Everyone loved when Gandalf comes to town. Or the storytellers that tell about adventures of Robin Hood. Do you see what I mean? And they get up for the night, free room and board, free dinner, and they share the news. And then that becomes newspapers and TV. And that's where the stories get told. The stories we have are from the storytellers. And when you were talking about what made these these writers in ancient times special, what something about them was different. If you've ever met a writer, a true writer, they cannot help themselves. They're no different than someone who doodles or someone who's constantly thinking up songs, someone who rhymes or someone who's always looking into this. There's something different about them and they can't help themselves but to write. It wasn't with an intent. They were urged to do so by the great beyond. Same with scientists and stuff. These are the true gifts that people get. And they did theirs. They were lucky enough to get to do theirs. I don't think they could have helped it. I think they were born to do that. Someone was born to do that. There's a lot of Buffies that are born on the planet, but all, or a lot of Slayers, right? But only one becomes the, the next Slayer right? The, all of them, there's lots of them at any given moment, but they have to be at the right time in their life and adolescent. They have to be in the right environment in order for them to be chosen. And they have to wait for the one before them to die. That That's how that program worked. Uh, and so that was them. There were lots of Wright brothers, but only one got the, the title and the photograph in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, the cobbler is that role played by the cobbler, as you laid out, is a similar role 
played by the traveling salesman or the circus. And these skills can be used for good. Yes. Yes. For for good or for bad, um, these people who traveled around or whatever could use their their oracle skills to perform magic tricks and deceive people or conversely to share new knowledge. And my guess is that they developed the skill much like the magician of figuring out who are the sheep and who aren't. And the cobbler could perhaps be doing a different job and cobbling is just the cover much like, in my opinion, the priests who listen to confessions are doing what seems to be overtly one job, appearing as an angel, helping everybody get to heaven by confessing all their sins, and could perhaps be doing a different job in the background of figuring out who and how to blackmail an entire community. But do you, do you, I see, and I'm sure that happens, but I find it really hard to believe that it goes back to the cobbler. I, I don't, I do, I, at some point, oh, yeah. it definitely was. Um, but for a long time, even the, even the cobbler would have been just telling what he was told. He'd only be repeating. And because he was so friendly and likable, you know, everyone looked forward to, you know, Gandalf every, you know, and he was doing himself, he was being himself. But when business got exactly. involved and we fast forward to the, the carpet salesman knocking on my door or the politicians knocking on my door, the agenda is very clear. And I'm not saying obviously at some point, you know, the if the if Gandalf's coming through town at some point, some fireworks company decides to promote him and they put a sticker on his skateboard when he goes through these fireworks came from Acme. Do you see what I mean? But that doesn't happen for a minute. So I think for a while it's happening in its natural course. And then somebody older or smarter, none of the above, just uh, gets a visit from an angel and they go, you know, what if I put advertising on the back of the bathroom stalls? Yes, it's not what we see in our culture today of all this uh, stories being spread through whatever type of methodology and media isn't uh, isn't controlled by one central organization. It's uh-huh. a mixture. It's a mixture of uh, of different intentions, and some copy others and. Uh, it's it's not controlled, absolutely. Just like the circus coming to town today, what's a clown? Clowns scare the the association between like uh, predators and creeps dressing up as clowns to kidnap children is is terrifying. And yet, if we were to go back in time to the first, who's the first clown in the world? Who knows? But at some point, clowns didn't exist. Today they do. do you, and historically, clowns were associated with a circus to make us laugh and provide com- comedic relief or some interlude between the changing of acts or whatever. There was a positive thing. Okay. And it was all presented to, to kids. You know, well, that's because they, they, kids, well, everybody knows that fear and laughter. So those fear and love. Yeah. Those are- very intrinsically, is that the word? Linked. They're intertwined. Yep. Uh, yep. And so the fear and the sex drive, again, that goes into a lot of the things we're seeing today. And that goes along with why adolescents really enjoy horror movies and why they're made for teenagers and young adults. That's what they're geared towards because it's a coming of age. It's a it's a changing of the guards in that, in that you're playing along those lines of what is scary and what is sexy at the same time. You know, I've got a mass murderer murdering a girl in a bikini who was just a slut a minute ago. I'm confused, but yet I'm not. You know what I mean? It's all twisted in pain and pleasure, I guess. 
even to the Jesus on the cross, I'm thinking, uh, uh, you know, because after the pain a birth, you know, after the pain comes the pleasure, the endorphins that run through when you're in a fearful situation and you're, you know, romancing the stone, if you will. And somehow after the death defying leap over the waterfall, you find each other in each other's arms and you're making out and you hated each other two seconds ago. You know, I, I really like your association between uh, the, cru the crucifixion and the crown of thorns and giving birth because <laughs> it, is, it, it, is, it is so genius and, and true as a metaphor. Absolutely. Even if it was real, even if it was a real event, it, it, it's the best metaphor for resurrection. Like, I, I can't imagine what it is like for a woman to go through a natural birth, but we're all, all alive today because our mothers and our grandmothers and so on and so forth and up until Adam and Eve or whatever we want to believe because they had to go through a natural birth and some of them didn't survive it. And we, we men can't imagine what that's like. And so what? this metaphor is of Jesus being whipped and tortured and having to wear a crown of thorns is as close as we can get mentally to right. recognizing and appreciating the sacrifices our mothers made, even if our mothers were bad mothers. Well, we have to look at too, the, the crown of thorns is what you would see stars if your head was squeezed or the, you couldn't breathe for a second. You'll see stars. And so the crown of thorns, the representation of the squeezing of the head or the moment of not being able to get oxygen, that <laughs> that moment people describe when they're drowning, where a voice just comes in and says, breathe. And they go, wait a minute, I'll die. Just breathe. Um, you've heard that comment being made to people who have drowned before where after, but you know, after they've been resuscitated and then you have the ring of fire, which is what the woman's vagina is experiencing where something just feels like a hot poker up your rear end. And those two things combined create the halo or the halo ring above the Christ seeing stars head. Yes. And I, I can sort of relate well, before sharing my experience, I encourage every man who's uh, about to be a father or has another kid coming on, along the way to, to be there and uh, not to run away and hide in the waiting room. And I would even encourage couples to have their child born at home. And if they can't have it born at home, get a doula or a midwife to assist and if not control what's going on in the hospital. But every man should be there. And um, in my experience, we had our second son born at home. And it's a good thing that we plan that because the labor was so quick and so short that if we had hopped into the car and drove off to the hospital, our, our whelp would have been at the bottom of the, would have been born in the car. It was so quick. And what I experienced is seeing the pain that their mother felt. And she was clearly in a different state of mind. She was not in control of herself. She I've, had, I've had natural births, Charming. How is that like? Would you recommend it? Oh, absolutely. But it hurts like hell. I see, almost had an ambulance baby. <laughs> you see, I, 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 I like how you say that. hurts like hell. Because the closest I could describe, it, it truly looked like she was possessed. When I talk but about... That's how the pain looked appeared. Yes. It was so... I was so scared myself. Because I, I saw she was experiencing a pain that is unspeakable. I, I don't know how to. But clearly she wasn't in control of herself and needed somebody beside her. Mm -hmm. Well, not everybody, but I, I do 
I do know the feeling. Uh, when I had my first, I am. Um, he, I could feel him moving when, when he, I got really into my meditation and I giggled. My midwife was giggling because I didn't make a fucking peep, but every time I'd have a contraction, I would start chewing on the straw. I had the ice water cause they, I was having a, I was in the tub and they didn't, I didn't want to get out. So I had, it couldn't get too hot. So I said ice water. So that I had ice water and I chew on the straw. And then I would get through that, that moment. And then I would just relax again. And so I went into kind of a trance state, but I'm used to pain. So I already know how to deal with it. Right. And I felt, I could feel him as if I was there with him, as if I was the body and the baby were one, right. I was having a euphoric expression. And I remember right when he was born, when I was feeling all of that, the ring of fire and everything, I had, you know, what you could describe a out of body. I didn't float above myself, but I became one with everything around me. And I had these flashes of, of you know, every woman throughout history, leading all the way back to Eve, that, you know, the first woman, whoever she is, you know, having that experience as if I was connected somehow you know, with what it was like to be a woman, a female of the species. <clears throat> it was a very, you know, um, euphoric um, experience for me. And essentially you created life. I mean, it was all, yeah, that was my, that was, that was what God designed me for. I did it, you know, in a sense. Yeah. And a uh, man, <sighs> objectively you exacted the power of, of a God. Mm -hmm. You created life. You did something that no machine or no other invention can do. And with it I, comes a lot of responsibility that you either accept or don't, but, you know, relating to Eve, the first mother, uh, and the first few stories that were given in scripture is that brother killed brother. Now, I can't imagine what it's like for a parent to lose a child, but what could be worse than to have one of your child kill the other? And we're not really given much of an explanation as to, or at least was an intelligent understanding of why one brother killed the other brother. But if we take what we're given in the scripture, it's a bit twisted and warped. Well, why wouldn't we, if they're toddlers, if that story comes from a toddler perspective, of course, Cain and Abel, because if you had two kids born, you know, close together, you're going to have this rivalry that's naturally going to take place. One brother, even the younger one, there's always going to be one that's going to be climbing on the other and these things. One that's more aggressive than the other. Opposites attract and all. So if it's a metaphor for the first siblings, why wouldn't they be in competition? So of course the story makes sense to me. I mean, imagine a child that's three or we'll say, you know, we'll call them Irish twins, as they say, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a year old baby, you know, just learning about the world, starting to move and another baby shows up. The rivalry begins instantly. I'm not getting nearly as much attention. I'm going to start acting out. I'm going to hit that baby over the head because I'm too young still to understand that that doesn't feel so nice. But it doesn't have to be. You see, perhaps parents have the ability to um, guide their kids and the siblings to have fun together more so than to fight. And maybe we're given the example of all the animals in the animal kingdom, cats and dogs, and we're given the example of animals that drop a litter of, you know, tons of siblings all at the same time. And we get to observe them play and fight and then eventually all grow up to become 
one tribe. And they don't, we don't expect or envision um, broods of, of cats and dogs and wolves growing up and killing each other off. We don't see that in nature. We don't, they, if there was to be a Bible story for wolves, I doubt it would be one brother killing off the other brother. <laughs> it would be the exact opposite of what we're given. I, I would expect. I, well, I, ways. Yeah. I mean, that just, if you, if you think that it's a natural thing we do and it's just a story to symbolize that, normal behavior we would have. That's just one of them. There's another story where the twins became identical and they, you know, started making horse carts or something together. And, you know, they were loved by all in the community. So, you know, I think it's just one of the many examples, but it's the extreme. And so that's why it gets so much attention. Yeah. I, I, look at a lot of scripture as being a Rorschach test. It gives an example of all the bad guys in the world and it gives a few examples of good guys and the person who reads the Bible, they can, they expose their soul based on how they interpret it and whose behavior they end up modeling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and since I punks really was in extreme on here because, you know, you get the extreme on, on the same in the same line, you just get an extreme. It's not two people from next door. These are exactly, you know, the black and the white. I got both here. The yes. Good and the bad and then the ugly. I would even dare say that some prophets in our ancient scriptures are presented as seemingly good guys who may not actually be good guys. If we try to put ourselves in their shoes and ask, okay, what would I do if I was in their shoes? How would I have turned into them how did they get there like why are people listening to them perhaps they're not good guys they were possibly instruments of bad guys and their 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 descendants rewrote stories to make them seem like they were the good guys that's just a suggestion to christians out there to be a little bit more critical in what they read and believe and what they follow along and use as examples um but that's just my opinion on the intention behind all these scriptures it's to give us to essentially act as a rorschach test to the next generation and uh, uh yeah why somebody reads the bible becomes a question do they want to get a good example or do they want to justify bad behavior? There you go. I just have to confess and ask Jesus into my heart. And I'm saved. Oh. And oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad you said that. See, there's another thing because punks is interested in being a Christian and whatever, whoever <laughs> is or whatever. I, I, I have I to. I, you are going to have a, th this will be fun. Keep your cool. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, I love it. See, because I, I to me, too. I love it. It's fun. Th th this is an, uh, was an eye opener for me. And ultimately there's two types of Christians and many of the Protestants share a lot of commonalities with the Catholics that they think are evil or whatever. But ultimately, from a theological perspective, there's two types of Christians. There's the Christians who believe that all you got to do is believe Jesus is real. And that's it. That's the first thing you got to do. And the most important thing you got to do is believe Jesus, whatever that means, and believe he's real and believe that he's, by saying his name, you're going to go to heaven and you don't have to do anything beyond that. And all you have to do is believe. And then there's the Christians who take the scriptures and actually read them and understand them and put them all together and believe that what you have to do is be a good person and follow Jesus' example. And so there's a whole world of Christians out there who say one thing and say the other, and there's a dichotomy. So what is a Christian is not a homogeneous definition. So depending on whose dictionary is better than the others, the concept of what is a Christian is a Rorschach test. So um, I, I, I love having discussions with Christians and discovering what type of Christian they are.
Because from the Muslim perspective, they see Jesus as being the perfect example of Islam. They go out and say, if you do what, if you follow Jesus' example, if you do what Jesus said, you are the perfect Muslim, period. Right. That's, that's what they say. And the concept of Islam, again, is, is up in the air, depending on who's selling the books and who's on television. But from their perspective, Jesus is the Messiah. He's not God. He, his job is to send a message. And he didn't write anything down. He set an example. So I don't know if I'm a Christian or not, but I'd like to follow Jesus' example in some regards. Sure. Uh, I can't do it in every example, in every way. As good of a person as I possibly can. And he's got some suggestions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I got to share an idea with you. Okay. This is, this is goofy, but I, I'm, I've, developed a collection of Bibles and other other uh, scriptural books and old science books that mix it all together. And I like seeing the differences between all the Bibles and translations, oh. between old prints and new prints and which words they change. That goes along uh, with yeah, what well, you yeah. talked about in your comment on your, on your video. Yeah. Right. Because and, it... It, it's being scrubbed. We'll never know. Yes. And I can only assume that's happened before. This isn't the first time. Maybe you think of stories like the Library of Alexandria or something like that, wars where things get scrubbed in the past. But unfortunately today, WikiHow, how to control people, make them think it's their idea. We all upload everything. We, we're not storing our books in jars and things under the ground. I mean, Everything can be destroyed, and the only thing that's left is what's on screens. And, and yes, how many of the next generations are going to be able to read between the lines? I, my we one and I were just talking because she sees the fake commercial, she now sees it. She goes, This one's a fake one, isn't it? I'm like, Yes, it is. And um, a lot of times we watch those somewhat paranormal slept ham type videos and together and I let her tell me how they how she thinks that's being performed what her even if she's wrong it doesn't matter she's recognizing that it's not real and so she's looking to why that you know appeared as a ghost what else could that possibly be you know and so I said to her that they have plans of making you know where you could talk to um, another person. And, and she says, I only hear your voice in my head. And I said, that's true. But one day, what if they could make a computered me that would talk to you like me and tell you things like me? And she said, no, I, I won't listen. She and, and I said, why? Because I might tell you something wrong, right? I might tell you to use this type of toothpaste. Yes, <laughs> she gets it. You know, I, that's the future that the, the kids have to look forward to if they're not being prepared for what's real and what's not real. I believe you're absolutely right. I believe we're being pre-programmed precisely for a future whereby um, children are given flashbacks that are fake. So through, you know, recorded everything. So what ex you just said, I, I, I believe is prophecy. And you're not using magical abilities. You're using your brain. You're being smart. And that, I, I really do believe that future generations will be given recordings that are doctored of their yes. parents. I believe and that's the case. Yes, most definitely. They're even talking about that now. They That's not even something that they hide as a potential future. But they say that they can collect all of me when I was on the internet, my voice and my yep. face, and they can recreate me. And so you can, and a lot of people will fall for that. A lot of people are going to be so desperate, especially in the future when there isn't anything left of anyone. They're going to be so desperate to grab, you know, think of it from a developmental stage. 
when when we're if we're moving out in our adolescence and we're going into the mid the young adult it's not till our middle life that we start again that third rebellion where we start to recognize man i wish my dad was still here to tell me what to do or my mom was still here to tell me what to do <clears throat> and if i had the access of a dead parent as comfort i would do that and that's the most simplest ideas Right. And that's a normal human behavior, which I think they're going to capitalize on. That's what I put in the theory. I call that the nostalgic stage, because every stage of development, we have a step back. We have a moment where we have a regression and we, you know, we miss. That's what high school reunions are. Right. It's a stage. That's what, you know, having an accident might mean for a toddler or, you know, going back to where the, the preschools running running around the house with, full of free autonomy and suddenly wants to be back held in mom's arms again, cuddled up like a baby. Um, those are just moments where that expresses itself in every single stage of our life. We have that. And I, and to me, if I was if I was a businessman and I knew that about human beings, you bet your bottom dollar I'd be investing in creating that for money or whatever the currency or currency is. Now, I I would like to share a dream, um, but this is just a a, um, a mental experiment to to bypass. The intention is how do we bypass that? that agenda of the future. So let's say, if we were to jump ahead in the future, your grandkids and my grandkids, let's say they bump into each other and your kids say, yeah, yeah, my grandma was Joni Rotten. And my kids say, yeah, my grandpa was the charming asshole. <laughs> right. How would they know? Like, what could you do? What could you say or share with your kids? And what could... I share or do or say with my kids to to give them that totem, much like in that Inception movie, mm. but a, 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 a mental totem so that they could figure out that, yes, that is the charming anarchist's grandkid and that is Joni Rotten's um, granddaughter. You know what I mean? Now, I don't think we should share that on the interwebs, but yeah. I, would encourage, I would encourage every single parent out there in the world to think along those lines. What can you transfer to your child? Now, it may not have to be a personal thing. It may simply be good parenting. Mm. That's more important than anything else. But well, okay, let's look at it from one with scale. Um, uh, one thing that I've noticed in my life, I come across people, my dad was definitely, and of course his dad was and so forth for little sayings, you know, those father words of wisdom that, that were passed down for generations. I experienced a lot of that, you know, you don't need a swing set if all your friends have a swing set. Oh, fuck. So I've come across, I've said things on streams and I've said things like that. And I've heard someone say, my dad used to say the exact same thing. Now our dads might not have met, but they definitely had some interesting connections. So you can do it from a meet to meet, like it's a password, but it, it could also be a type of language. And, and for me, you know, that's important that my wee one recognizes that if she just stops and stands still, whatever problem she has, even if I'm not here, I will give her the answer because I talk to her all the time. And I, you know, I, I just, we're just always talking. And so, you know, she hears my tone and she knows the type of language I use and she knows the type of things that I would say. So someone else came up to her later on and said, your mother is this or your mother said that she can challenge that immediately. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know what you're selling me, but I don't think so because I paid a lot of attention that I think has been taken away from the families today. That's something that would have been very important. And why not spending a lot of time with your children is detrimental to, to their future. They're not hearing you. They're hearing everyone else. 
And I believe that's exactly like you said, that's part of the agenda, keeping everybody separated, Absolutely. keeping kids in school for hours and hours and hours, yeah. running around. Learning, nothing. Learning yeah. something that, you know, a public school for part, part, um, homeschool, 20 minutes a day for an elementary school. If they can give you a 20 solid time block, you know, it might take you two hours to get 20 minutes, but you can do a lot in 20 minutes where they'd be sitting there for six hours to get the same amount of information they could absorb in 20 minutes of uninterrupted time with you. That That's pretty interesting. And so by the time they're reaching, you know, high school and stuff, two hours is all they really need to d dedicate to the average you know, education there. And then of course, hopefully they'll find their own interests and take that two hours and expand it further, or they'll spend the rest of the time playing video games. Just the ability for a child to witness their parents being parents or just being adults, minding their own business, calmly living, spending time, not running around furiously doing stuff, has a lot of value. Absolutely. Learning what is a normal way of calming down at the end of the workday and chilling mm. is something that doesn't work for the new canola agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's the case because my wee one will recognize we read every night. So reading becomes the calm down. Everything is down to the lamp and the book. And that's the last thing we do before we go to bed. So she does like to read and like to be, listen, you know, read too. And um, oh, so maybe that that is the good that you said. So now I'm hoping that that will be the thing she'll have comfort in, you know, just sit down and read then, you know, it, do something else besides sit there in your head and feel bad and go research it on the internet. <laughs> go to betterhelp.com. Yeah, ultimately, the best way of teaching is to set an example. Mm -hmm. Of what, and, you know, we, well, as parents, we can set an example of what's normal, or leastways what's calm. Homework's not calm. Rock music's not calm. Video games aren't calm. Mother's oh, we all got suckered into all those things, didn't we? <laughs> I know. Isn't it sad? Oh, I do. We do listen to audiobooks, but I read to her, you know, equally, if not more so. I think that's, and have her read to me. I think that's important. You know, because I don't want her stuck on audiobooks either. I don't, you know, that's nice, but that's not good either. I mean, I, you know, you know the thing, I'm just doing the best I can and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that it's the right thing. And she, and I'm well aware she could come back at 30 or whatever and say, my mom was totally wrong, but she can't say she didn't try something different. You know what I mean? Even if yes. she hates me, at least I'm doing what I think is best and the best I can at that. I'm not perfect. I didn't get no book. You know, I've ne I've never been here before. This is all as new to me as it is to her and recognizing that. And I'll tell her things like, um, well, if you if I ever do something you don't like, you know, like make you clean your room or eat your vegetables, which she likes vegetables. But you know what I mean? Then you're welcome to change that when you have children. You do the opposite. You try something else. So every one of my failures just gets chalked up. And I, that was because with my mother, when I was a young girl, I'd say to myself or write in my diary, I will not do this. I will not do that. You know, I won't be this, whatever it was that I despised, whatever behavior, you know, I'm not going to act that way. I still could screw up, but it won't be that one. I ain't making that mistake again, you know. That could be a great way of setting an example. <laughs> I don't want her to beat herself up for her failures either. You know, I don't like that either. You just, you do what you can and you just make the next day the best day. That's all you can ask for. 
you're going to fail. You're going to have falls. It, there's no doubt. There's no way around it. The universe gets involved and in, in other people and, and you're going to have these moments. But the best thing is, is that you just take a deep breath and screw up again the next day. That's what you do until I, I'm reminded of that story. I've heard, uh, you know, like uh, some monk somewhere, some ball guy say, um, you know, about avoiding the hole. You see the hole, you, you slip in a hole. You didn't know it was there. The next day you see the hole, you think about it, you fall in it again. You fall for it again. Well, maybe it's not as deep as I remember. And the third day you get close to the hole and you try not to, but you get a little too, you wanted to look in and you slipped back in. But then the next day you walk around it and eventually you just go a different way altogether and the hole no longer exists in your life. You won't fall in it course there's other holes <laughs> but the better you get at it the, the more things you can avoid you know you can see okay now the terrain is starting to look like another hole is coming up so to get stuck in a hole in your lifetime is not a bad thing it, it is a bad thing but you you can get out and, and you don't have to do the same behavior again know thyself and all know your triggers know the things that draw you in understand what it is about these assholes that you're so attracted to why do you keep falling for their lure or their magic spells exactly yeah i i i, I want to provide a little bit of parenting advice for all the lazy parents out there along the lines of reading a story before you go to bed um and this just comes from me being a lazy father. Uh, <laughs> um, one option is to, rather than read a story to your kids, is invent a story. And I'm just going to share my lazy ass experience. Okay. Basically, I had a hard time staying up and reading books. And so what I would tell my kids is, how about we create our own story and so i would ask them to suggest who the characters would be so whether it was a turtle or a teddy bear or a cat or a dog or a, a bunch of little birds they would suggest the characters and then i would ask them okay so what are they going to do and so we would suggest them going over to the pond to have a swim and ultimately it becomes them making up the story and me just going along and they end up telling the story to me and getting a kick out of inventing and mm. them being the creators. So for me, it was just me being lazy. Um, but the end result was them inventing the story themselves. So I'm if you're a lazy ass father like me, <laughs> There's a way out. Fairy tale or a nursery rhyme. Yeah. Um, the other day I was driving, my mother and I were driving in we when it was girls' day. And in the car, my mom and I were talking about growing up in, you know, in Maine and and what it was like being a kid and in the snow and all of that and everything. And mine wasn't much different from my mother's because I'm a cusper there, you know, I still had an experience of, of course she had all the outhouses and all of these other things that I didn't get to necessarily experience and not a peep out of the wee one in the back for like half an hour driving to our destination. And finally my mother turned back and, and said, you know, man, you have been very quiet. And she's just listening to the two of us talk about these stories. And she's thinking, I wish it was like that now, you know, us remembering these funny things that happened and she's having these questioning the world that's around her that she's having to experience and, and telling me she wishes it was like when I was a kid, she'll say, or back when Laura was a kid. And I've noted before that it's funny when she listens to these old stories and stuff, she doesn't recognize all the chores. She's only just now saying things like, I don't know. That sounds like a lot of work as if she's trying to find a balance between living that way and then living this way. But she was very quiet while we were talking. And I thought that was a very mature. It, it's as if I could read her mind as she was calculating these stories 
you know, into time and, and now watching her play outside since then, you know, I'm thinking, is she recognizing that these are the stories she'll be telling her kids? I remember playing out in the woods and I remember making myself a fairy garden and painting my name on trees and, and wood and, you know, these types of things. Well, she remembers sitting at the swing set with her friend giggling over something that was funny getting lost, you know, in the woods or getting stuck in a snow plow, you know, a snowbank. You know, it's funny that you, you, you mentioned that one thing I noticed that's different among lots of people is how early their childhood memories go back in time. And there's some people who don't have like many childhood memories, or at least they haven't retained many and others do and some people's memory goes back to the age of three even three or four like like you said is the beginning of being able to get up and move and that um, is the beginning of most memories most memories are around three and four years old so most people can't remember earlier than that very very few and and i would challenge some of those beliefs anyway some of those memories anyway, but the average yes. person's memory is, is created. You can remember flashes of things from being three or four, typically some type of traumatic event or something ex exceptionally happy happening that you can have flashbacks to. <clears throat> but, you know, to note that as well as the time of memory movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I, I like to tie this into reincarnation. I really do believe that the purpose of a lot of these scriptures is that these clerics are trying to encode, write down messages so that when they or their kids come back in a future generation, we'll be able to decode it because supposedly we, our memories are wiped out at birth, according to a lot of this reincarnation theology and they want to figure out a method of retaining them and perhaps they already did and they're just keeping that hidden from us i just find it interesting that there's a minority amongst christians jews muslims and a majority of hindu who who recognize reincarnation as being scriptural it's esoteric and it's not a big deal amongst popular churches, but it's in there. It's in scripture. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I, I, I don't know what's real. I can wait. <laughs> I'm happy to wait. Well, I'll tell you this. I don't think there's a way to do it wrong. So I've come to that as my knowing. I don't think there's a way to, I don't think there's a secret knock or a code or a scripture that is going to be the key. So there's no way to do death wrong is what I mean. You're going, you can't not pray enough or you can't forget to, you know, eat your cereal or something or, or accept Jesus in your heart. There's, there's, there, there is no loophole. It just is. And so any of all of this extra stuff that's added onto it is, schemes in my opinion it's to fear me and to dying afraid it's 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 just there for nonsensical purposes but to make money on this physical realm i suppose i have a theory along those lines that links all the whatever the tw these twisted clerics uh whether it's catholic or otherwise and our twisted science and medicine of 2020 now and all the all the worldwide lies i i believe that all these bad guys do believe in the supernatural or that their ultimate fear is the supernatural and that what they're trying to figure out is to identify the birth of a true supernatural prophet, 
somebody that truly does have telepathic abilities and they want to catch that person, whether it was through the deception of medicine or the deception of the solar system and science or the deception of theology and spirituality, they're presenting all these deceptions because they want to find a person who knows the truth from birth. And I know the truth from birth. I am not fooled by their magical elixirs. <laughs> I fall for no religion. That's when I had my, I'll say Kundalini. Um, that was what I, that's my knowing. My knowing said, my knowing said, don't worship anything. Not even me. That's what it said. Don't worship anything. Not even me. Do not. In other words, even I am like a channel that will say, don't accept any comments. They're not from me. That's what that meant. That's what God was telling me at that moment. That My name is being used. So don't even trust me right now. I believe therein lies one of the uh, secrets in scripture. It's that there will be many people coming in my name. Don't trust any of them. That's exactly what I heard. Yeah. So, you know, that's what I, I hear my own voice. I ask my own questions. Everything, you know, I, I try, I listen to what people are saying, of course. But at the same time, I, I go back and I think of, I meditate on it myself. I, I can't just, I'll try your Kool-Aid, sure. But I, I, I want to swish it in my mouth a minute. I might spit it back out. I might not be interested and your flavor. I'm way past that now because I I've come to my own either. I'm not persuaded by anything, which most people find somewhat annoying about me that I I'm an instant. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Whatever it is I haven't. And then I think about it. Well, hang on. Let me think. Let me think if I'm, if I'm okay with this. You know, that can be an annoying habit to have when you have a lot of people that want you to go along with them. It may be an, a, a natural reflex after lots of deception. <laughs> well, after a lot of deception. <laughs> Do you want a cupcake? No. Well, wait a minute. Who? Where'd it come from? Who made them? <laughs> you know, let me gather all the information first before I take your candy. Let me see the recipe. Right. Is this used with non-dairy? <laughs> is it GMO'd? Does it have S O M S G in it? What is it? Actually, actually you know what? You've just you've just opened up one of the magic tricks. Um, the the next question, well, my cynical question is, okay, did you is there any ingredient that you're not telling me is in there? Right. You know, because, you know, lots of people are poisoned and there's stories of children being poisoned with cakes over the years. And um, ultimately, what's the magic trick of today is the ingredients list on the label of whatever packaging. It's got eggs in it. Yes. Anaphylactic shock on the way. Yeah, and the way the bad guys get away with poisoning and spreading poison pills and fouling people up is by providing an ingredients list and expecting us to read it. So some of these ingredients lists will state quite clearly that there's something unsafe in it, and they know nobody reads the fine print. And some of these ingredients lists have stuff that do not clearly say what they are. You have to then go on the internet or go to the library and then learn what that ingredient is. And I want to link this up with the, um, the, the, the PFAS, those um, forever chemicals, perfluorinated, yeah, whatever, exactly. those, 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 um, those uh, forever, forever chemicals that, are appearing in the water and everywhere we go now. If we pick up the, if we go through the um, the uh, the aisles of your grocery store, 
and pick up anything that has a perfume or a fragrant or an artificial flavoring or go through the soaps and detergents aisle and read the ingredients there, we'll find stuff that are forever chemicals in there and they're concealed in these generic words like fragrance mm. yeah. or artificial well, color. Uh, okay. So an example of a, an item that says, you know, ingredients, peanuts, but they, it's smashed and it's click, you know, it's got, do you see what I mean? I'll give yep. you another one. coffee, freeze dried coffee. What's the ingredients on the jar? It says coffee. That's it. My question goes, how do they turn it into a free? They just, I'm just going to assume because that's what business magic is that it's coffee that gets uh, dried up. So, you know, uh, what is it? Um, I just have to add water. Dehydrated. So I'm assuming that it's dehydrated coffee. They take real coffee because there's only one ingredient. But I, I have to think about what's the dehydration process? What chemicals? Well, let's take, here's another thing my wee one and I were discussing the other day. Recycling. She had a bottle and it said this bottle was made from recycling plastic. And she was showing me, mom, my bottle was made from recycled plastic. And I said, that's really cool. Now, what are you going to do with the bottle? Because we don't have recycling anymore. I guess I have to throw it away. So what, who is to blame for this bottle now ending up on the planet? Her. You see, the business just passed the buck. We recycled it, but we are giving it to you and you have no way of recycling it. So it's now your responsibility for an eight-year-old to catch on. They've left her no option but to not recycle. And the recycling's over now. Nobody's doing that. There's no money in it. Not to mention the amount of chemicals and the amount of waste that is produced and carbon and all the rest to recycle. And again, contributing to more microplastics in the world. How about we stop using the bottles altogether? Well, you know what? I'm going to be um, I'm going to be a little bit assholeic and say that what we can do is throw it in the trash, bundle up our trash, sell it to people on the other end of the world. They're not and... buying anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I already learned. They said no. We don't want your shit anymore. You know, I did a deep dive into that. The amount of third world countries that were going through trash. You know, trash being just dumped in their areas and them using these people basically to, to sift through it, to take stuff to be recycled. You know what I'm saying? What a scam. What a scam. And now their countries look like shitholes because then the pay people that say, Australia being one of them, we don't want your trash anymore. And now Australia's got stuck with all their trash. They Nobody wants to buy it anymore. Nobody wants their trash they have to take oh, it back. No problem. What we can do is we can burn it and use it as fuel. Right. Fill the air with microplastic fumes of ashes. I love it. Do you know that during World War II, there were Nazi soldiers drinking out downstream from the ashes that were coming out of the, you know, the burners? They're drinking the dead, basically, they were. So were many soldiers. Just these types of ideas that are stories and you think, fuck, that's sick. That's disturbing. I never even thought of that before. You know, How I, ironic. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think um, the, the truth behind a lot of wars is, is much more sinister in that. I, I suspect that a lot of soldiers were used as guinea pigs to test chemicals Definitely. and uh, and so whether it, they were subjected to <laughs> these chemicals inadvertently <laughs> through the water or whether it was deliberately sprayed upon them i don't know False. but yes i fear that it's it's it definitely was done to them we know that just from iraq war and the burning of whatever the fuck was in the field. I and should today, also know that the 
farmers were burning tires. Literally one of the worst contributors to the quote global warming problem. Burning tires is absolutely horrible to the environment and to us as a species. And yet our go-to is to burn them in piles out of protest. Do you see something not lining up here? And I find it odd because old tires are kind of useful as an industrial product. Like they can be used for other things, mm. you know, they can be used as to, to, um, to, to, to act as um, retaining walls. They can be used in construction. You know, there's different ways of recycling tires without having to burn them up and melt them down. But it, it's a, uh, it's it, 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 it's a pity w when they're burned. They're also used as weapons too, you know. But uh, um, I, I, I want to ask your opinion about about chemicals and forever chemicals and how they're related to perfumes. Do you remember as a well, kid? Go ahead. Was, this is our last question, Charming. I've got to. I've got some okay. other things I have to do. We've been three hours. Okay. So, but we will continue next week, of course. So do you remember? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember as a kid, there's always the teacher who had perfume and you kind of <laughs> recognize them in the hallway by yeah. their perfume. Okay. And then there was the development of no perfume environments, right? Right. Because there's some people who are allergic. Now today, do you notice perfumes everywhere in public spaces more so than ever before? I, I, not ever before, but I have noticed more perfume wearers out in public because we had a moment where there was a bit of non-perfume and now it's very, the world has become much more fragrant again. For a while it was, remember all the candle stores and the, you know, dried flower crispy stores. Yep. And now that disappeared for a while because they stuck up the mall, but they're back. It's back. Yeah. It's made its way very interesting the world's becoming very fragrant again uh, yeah i fear um there's gonna be a lot of people who are poisoning themselves very fair because... talcum powder and all just yeah. another example walk through it close your eyes spray in the air walk through it i poison myself with incense <laughs> that's my that's different. choice uh, you're right that's exactly different. what i think see <laughs> That's a different thing. A dollar, some dollar incense sticks from the dollar store made in India or China. That's how I prefer to poison myself in my air. <laughs> you <Me> too. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm okay with it. Pick your poisons. Yeah, I have noticed being out, go to the store and you can, people are very, very fragrant. It, you can smell it a couple aisles over. At times, you're like, oh, God. <clears throat> you know, the Avon lady has is back. How many were sprayed in the mall? I mean, think of all of that. How would you know what that smell is when you're fighting a room full of smells? What you end up smelling in the perfume department is a mixture of perfumes. It's not going to smell like that when you get home. <laughs> How would you know they're safe? <laughs> True. I find it hard to believe any of them are safe. I don't know. It's very weird. Anyway. Well, thank you, Charming. Thank you. I enjoyed it. A few comments here. Ah, de toilette. I used to have I used to work at Captain D's. You've heard me tell this. And there was a friend of mine who was a boy that had a crush on me. And I showed up to a, a gathering one time after working a long shift. And he says, you smell so good. What are you wearing? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I said, yeah, a, a toilette de shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> it is the fragrance of, of seafood is what I smell like. Fries and fish. I'm fish and chips. He must have liked the smell anyway. Funny. I mean, you'd just reek a fish after leaving there. There's no, you would have to shower or you'd just go with it. I just went with it. Everybody knows <laughs> where I work. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be late. 
<laughs> I'll shower there. Maybe someone can join me. Um, <clears throat> we're going skinny dipping anyway, right? Indian blankets and made in India. Um, so yes, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Punks, you're welcome to join me. I don't want to have a bash the charming stream though. That won't be any fun for me. So <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'd enjoy it. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't, I would be, I'll okay. let the two of you have, I would totally just let the two of you have a discussion if you, if you could keep it. Oh, yeah? Simple. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, that's, I, that sounds like fun. Okay. Well, that's open to you two, but if you wanted to come up and talk to me, punks, I would prefer we talk about the topics, but then give our own, I'd love to hear your interpretation. Now, I'm totally down for that, but I so wouldn't mind watching the two of you have it out. I'm down. Oh, that me. sounds like a riot. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so long as you're there to keep us in line. I like would have got... to be the referee. I'll dish out yeah. my recording. <laughs> or, or, or we could have a great big gong and you'd like yeah. the gong show. I'm sure I can find something here. I've got one of these things on my desk. Hang on. Um, let's see. What's it got? No, that's not a good whistle. Hang on. There we go. An air horn. <laughs> so Sounds like guys, a party. Um, you guys work out a date and time and, and then I'll, I'll host it for you. Um, oh, we'll talk I, about great stuff. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm sure we'll probably have more people here than ever before. Um, but I, yes. Yeah, so I've got, I mean, to go get plants today for our beautiful soil. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to be off to. Amen. I was planning on doing some gardening too. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, right. Everybody do some gardening. We'll see if we catch each other later today, depending on how our days go. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Charming. Okay. Thank you. You take care. And thanks a lot to the rest of the Chatter gang. Excellent. And uh, if anything, we'll definitely see each other next Sunday morning. All right. Okay. You take okay. care. I'll... All right. uh, I, I look forward to the bounce out. I, I really dig the uh, the oh, roller skating. We'll do it. We'll bounce out then. It's been requested. So thanks, chat, for coming. Much love. I'll throw the goodbyes up on the screen as we're bouncing out. Okay, adios. This public service announcement is brought to you by Rotten Studios. Remember, no contact is the road to freedom. <laughs>